Hi, listeners. This is the 80,000 Hours Podcast, the show about the world's most pressing problems and how you can use your career to solve them. I'm Rob Wiblin, Director of Research at 80,000 Hours. Today is our second episode about the broad set of positions that we're calling operations roles, and it follows on from the previous episode with Tara McAuley, which attracted some pretty strong reactions. Tanya and Tara have somewhat different views, so if the topic particularly interests you, you may well want to listen to both. If you're interested in roles like this, the Centre for Effective Altruism is still accepting applications for an Events Specialist, EA Grants Evaluator, UK Operations Specialist, and US Operations Specialist. But applications do close this Monday in about five days, so you'll want to act on that right away. You can learn more about those roles at centerforeffectivealtruism.org slash careers. We also list a wide variety of other operations roles at 80,000hours.org slash job hyphen board. Without further ado, here's Tanya Singh. Today, I'm speaking with Tanya Singh. Tanya is the executive assistant to Professor Nick Bostrom at Oxford University's Future of Humanity Institute. Tanya has an MBA and engineering degree with a major in computer science. And in the past, she's worked in HR consulting, business development, user growth, and data analytics, including running a monthly P&L sheet of up to $100 million. Over the last six years, she's worked at companies including Mercer Consulting, the world's largest human resource consulting firm, Indian e-commerce company Snapdeal, and online education nonprofit Khan Academy. So thanks for coming on the podcast, Tanya. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to be here. So we plan to talk about the uh, social impact of careers in operations and how listeners can potentially do a lot of good by pursuing one. But first, it'd be good to find out a whole lot more about your background. So uh, tell me just about the the story of uh, the work you've been doing since you completed your studies. Sure. So I did my computer science engineering and then without having a very good idea of why I wanted to do management or what sort of management did I want to get involved in, I very quickly did an MBA in HR right after my engineering degree. And then after that, I joined the consulting firm, Mercer, for a couple of years where I was working either at Mumbai or Delhi, working with MNC clients who had operations all over the world, but mostly focused on their Indian and Southeast Asian operations, being a part of projects that involved change management, org design, uh, designing competency frameworks, performance management systems, etc., And I think that gave me a bit of an insight into how organizations function, uh, how you're like a part of a larger system trying to make something happen. And I felt that I could possibly uh, have more impact, be happier if I moved closer to business rather than coming in to do an intervention with this organization that's dealing with its issues. So getting a very partial picture of what the actual issues are and proposing a solution and walking away or helping implement some of it. So I think that's sort of a... So the consulting world does that sort of engagements largely, and uh, something about that was unsatisfying. So I moved closer to business, and I got an opportunity to work with uh, Snapdeal, which was uh, an Indian e-commerce homegrown giant competing with Flipkart. And after I joined Snapdeal, I think Amazon entered the Indian market and like a force. So my a year and eight months with Snapdeal were very educational, but very activity laden and a lot happened and Snapdeal grew to be a 12,000 people company after I joined them. And I must have been like a, a thousand something sort of employee, even when we had like all operations in-house that time, mm-hmm. customer calling team, etc. So, and then they, they grew to 12,000 people, then they cut back to 6,000 people or something at the time, during the time I was leaving. So it was a wild ride with a lot happening, a lot of good learning from there, a uh, lot of good learning about what not to do from there. So I, after working in Snapdeal, I realized that it's important for me to feel that what I'm doing is very meaningful. And I that, that element was sorely missing. And I used to fantasize about working for an organization where like, I really cared about uh, the change that they were trying to bring in the world. So after completing the second project, is a premeditated decision I left. Uh, I'd requested my manager back then, who I worked really well with, learned a lot from him, uh, to connect me to someone in Khan Academy, because Khan Academy was a very inspiring company to me. I'd used their product for my own MBA prep, and uh, I'd heard about the founder's story, very inspiring. So I was actually lucky enough to join that company because they just started operations in India and that's why I read about it and hence made the request. And it was an eye-opening experience because it was a team of 100 people who not not all of, like I did not get to interact with all of them, but it was very clear that they were very inspired in their mission and uh, everyone had focused on education from one angle or the other in their past work. 
and had come together under the Khan Academy umbrella to do something. So it, it mattered a lot to everyone. And you could see that in the way they were interacting, in the way they were expressing disagreements. So yeah, it felt very right. And I thought that I also wanted to work in an organization like this in a cause area that really mattered to me. So meanwhile, my life was going through a bunch of changes. We'd moved to London because my partner wanted to uh, shift to uh, working in AI safety. So I reached out to a few of these organizations, a few of them being like uh, OpenAI, DeepMind, uh, Miri. I saw FHI's website. They, hadn't, they only had research roles that time. But I remember seeing Miri's website to be very encouraging of people with op skill set to sort of reach out. So I reached out and then Matthew Graves from Miri put me in touch with Neil. And uh, yeah, I came to FHI. So that's like a overview of my <laughs> work journey. I, I should point out because I think I'd want to dive into something uh, on these lines, but I've I've held very different roles. So I was an HR consultant and then I was like doing business development, setting up a category for uh, an e-commerce company, which involves defining the product uh, somewhat because it was a, it required slightly different uh, product features from Snapdeal's regular e-commerce platform because you were buying cars and bikes online. And then working on uh, this a huge intervention project to sort of make the unit economics work better. So you were working with customer team, seller team, training, bunch of different teams. And then I did data analytics and user growth for Khan Academy, which is absolutely something that I'd never done before, but that was what they wanted. So I did some like, sort of very quick upskilling. I only worked with them for seven months, uh, eight months and focused on that. And then I very briefly joined as a product head, uh, a fintech company in London before coming to FHI and doing like everything that we couch under the umbrella of operations at FHI. Okay, so you, you weren't that happy in these roles in the end, so you wanted to move Eesh. into something different. I guess now, now you're kind of in, in a university. Yeah, I wasn't very excited about working in e-commerce and I realized it after like a year and a half of having worked there. Uh, what was the reason? Just that it wasn't that meaningful? Yeah, it wasn't that meaningful. I really liked the one person uh, who taught me probably the most that I know about running a business or like running a project tightly. Badal Malik, I worked with him on the second project that I worked with on Snapdeal. So I think the pull for me was to continue learning from him and working rather than being associated with this organization. So I think he left after we completed our project. And that was when I decided that I'm sort of done with Snapdeal. I'm also done with e-commerce in general. Yeah, I wanted to very actively move away from uh, e-commerce or I wanted to continue working with tech or maybe even startup kind of companies because I think the exposure that you can get in a startup is way more than what you would get in something that's like a very well-run, uh, well-oiled machine where you have your fixed role and probably uh, not much elbow room unless you establish yourself to uh, get, go outside the remit of your role. So startups or smaller companies give you that flexibility. And that's something that I would have definitely preferred. But I did not want to work towards consumerism of sorts, because I was also getting to a point where I thought that digital advertisements and part of my job was to make sure that people clicked on my ad rather than anyone else's ad. And I find online ads annoying and have blocked them. So I, I sensed a certain <laughs> level of hypocrisy in what I was generally doing. And that made me really sad. So yeah, I decided there was a premeditated decision that after I, I'm done with my project, I, I will leave. I was pretty clear about that. So uh, what were you doing at, at Khan Academy? So I joined them to uh, launch like a user growth plan for them. They were launching operations in India, had launched operations in India. Sandeep, who, was the, who is the India Khan Academy head, head, was setting up his team. So I joined them to figure out who are the people who are using Khan Academy. So even without focusing on their user base, they had like 400,000 monthly active users. Mm. Uh, that's a lot. And this was with no sort of focus on the market. This, these were people who were of their own accord. God knows where they've heard about Khan Academy from, were, were using the platform and using it quite uh, extensively. So what I did was I did a qualitative and a quantitative analysis of this data set. I joined them just to sort of focus on what will lead to more user growth in India. It was a very broad kind of a project. It resulted into uh, concrete uh, pieces of work where I did like a user uh, research survey of sorts. So I looked at the data quantitatively, sliced the users into four categories, depending on their usage habit, time spent on platform and things like that, the, the parts of the tool that they were using and things like that. Uh, then interviewed some sample users from all of these categories and came up with uh, some some recommendations of how to grow, which user base to focus on to grow and what are the kinds of things that we could be doing to grow them. And then some digital marketing initi initiatives just to see what are some low lift things without pumping any money or energy that you could do 
to uh, keep them engaged or make inform them about other things. Some really interesting insights came out after we spoke, since this was the first initiative to spoke, speak to people who are actually using the product in India. Interesting insights were called out of that. And then finally, I submitted like a year-long growth management plan that Khan Academy, some, something of that has been implemented in 2017. And I think uh, they're up from 400,000, they're now uh, 1.5 odd million users per month, unique users per month. Uh, just in India. So that's quite phenomenal. But yeah, much, much of that has to, like, it's not to be credited to my growth plan. It's to be credited to the amazing product that they have going there and some really good initiatives that they've taken to improve the engagement with their product. So you've worked in, I guess, quite a mature international corporate, uh, a, a startup that's scaling really quickly, a nonprofit, and now a university. Do you want to have any comments on the different, on the like the the range of different cultures that you've that you've worked in, and which ones which ones you like, which ones you don't? Yeah, I certainly have like a strong uh, bias towards really liking FHI and Khan Academy for the kind of things that they're focused on. Like, I think that's resonates heavily with me, strong, speaks strongly to me. More FHI because I really care about these cause areas. Uh, but Khan Academy was a brilliant working experience. And if we'd not moved to UK or like counterfactually, I can say that I would probably never have left Khan Academy mm. <laughs> unless they'd kicked me out because I was so happy working with them as a team and the mission that they were focused on. So yeah, I think all organizations function fairly differently. They have problems that you you can you can see same themes in those problems, but uh, they deal with very different demons depending on what their size is, what they're trying to accomplish, uh, the kind of people they attract, which leads to this larger this culture thing, uh, which is so hard to encapsulate, so hard to change or intervene in. It gets set by the will of the. Uh, head of the organization uh, and yeah there's there's so much nuance there so i think all organizations are very different but in terms of the kind of people who would work well there or the kind of people who'd find joy in working with a snap deal versus a khan academy that's i think something some people should explore for themselves because the experience can be really different and this is not to say that working at fhi is all uh, it's awesome it's all fun and play and there's nothing hard about it because i love uh, what they're doing um, i think unequivocally fhi is the hardest role that i've ever done in my life like across across the board if i if i compare fhi to snap or khan academy it's really hard and it i i can ex- i'll we'll hopefully explore why it's hard yeah tell me yeah. what do you do at fhi so i'm coming up to a year in fhi now uh, and i joined as a temporary administrator Joined a team of uh, five people then, focused on different bits of operations, a website, and there was uh, an associate director that we had. One person who was functioning as Nick Bostrom's EA, Kyle Scott. So there was this team that after like two to four months of my joining, everyone sort of moved on to different roles. So I got to do whatever I could and wanted out of all this. And somewhere, I think in September, I started focusing on being uh, a full-time EA to Nick Bostrom and then doing whatever I could in which 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 was in the gamut of the all the other roles. That's, that's executive assistant, not effective actress. Yes, <laughs> executive assistant to Nick Bostrom. Yes, so I think I'd, I've done like a wide variety of things. I've handled some website and social media uh, last few months. I've I'm handling the HR process. I handled the HR processes for quite some time. For five six months, I was the only ops person around. So or only ops person along with the web and comms person. Uh, so yeah, I've done a fair few different projects within FHI and. Uh, the only constant of my role is sort of working as Nick's EA, so churning through his email, doing his media arrangements, uh, booking his travels, uh, sort of trying to be a force multiplier to him, and then mm-hmm. making sure that I pass along information that's relevant. I take an input on uh, organizational priorities and then try and push out projects which are important for FHI, given that we were going through this period of churn. Now we, again, have almost four people, like the fourth due to join in a month or so for people ops team in place. So there's been a bit of a change uh, in this. So I, yeah, I can't answer it simply. Uh, what is it like being the only ops person in an organization of something like 20 people? I mean, is, isn't that just insane? It's hard. Yes. That's why I, <laughs> I, I said FHI was hard. It's also because I think there's a lot of self-imposed pressure that I had. And I, I've seen other people in the effective altruism community who work in operations or across the board, but basically the ones that I can sympathize with their situation, empathize with their situation, sorry, work in ops, because you feel that you're directly responsible for making sure that these people who are working towards this cause area that you really care about can do their work very efficiently. And anything that's very inefficient is probably because operations aren't running as smoothly as they should. So there's a lot of self-imposed pressure towards not destroying value in the future or not being a part of something that is actively 
not able to contribute to the value that you can generate for the future. So hence, probably a negative contribution. So that's the hard part, which brings you sort of down. And then not everyone that FHI or an organization like FHI interacts with is bought into your ideology to the extent and the level that you are. So if you're dealing with Oxford University, who have many institutes like FHI and all focusing on all sorts of important and different and eclectic issues, the communication between you and them uh, needs to be taking into account that they don't think that you're saving the world or whatever, (laughs) that you're doing these things, which are probably one of the most important things that people should be focusing on. So tempering that that side of you down, making sure that you're communicating what's relevant to be communicated and you're not getting disheartened by things not moving, uh, being okay with that, especially if you're the only ops person. Like when I was the only ops person, all the things that did not happen in FHI uh, were my fault. And no one told me so. Like people here are pretty kind. So they would tell me that it's, it's all right and we're, we're in a special situation. But it's hard to keep taking comfort in that for months that we're in a special situation. Things need to happen. And if they're not happening, you're probably dropping some very important balls. So, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've heard that you work pretty insane hours. So maybe you can make that kind of thing work. But I mean, I mean is, that, is that typical among people in ops that uh, kind of the work drives you forward to... No, I don't think it's a ops uh, specific thing. Uh, I also don't think it's a required thing to be able to do what you are doing well. I think it's a uh, some people are obsessive and some people aren't. Like I'm fairly in the uh, obsessive people category. I've always worked hard, even arguably where I shouldn't have, you know, spent so many hours because I did not add any additional value by spending three extra hours. But it's a bit of a your own nature and working style kind of thing. So that's that's why I do it. But I don't think that's, you need to have that orientation. I think you can balance out your work and make sure that you're prioritizing right and having like a support system in place, like a big team can take on a lot of things. If one person's trying to do everything, uh, then yeah, they'll, they'll be faced with a different challenge. So I found that a bit challenging when I was the only person, but something's also to be said about like the comfort you draw uh, from the knowledge that you're plugging some hole that might actually be sinking the ship right now. So yeah, that was that. That thing drives you also, uh, or at least drove me. Okay, let's back out from uh, what you're specifically doing to thinking about operations uh, more broadly. What kind of roles are operations? Is, is this kind of a natural grouping, or is it just a grouping of kind of everything that's that's not perhaps research in, in FHI's case? Yeah, depending on the industry in which you're operating, different things would be grouped under operations. But uh, if I talk specifically about FHI, anything that's not research is operations, like you said. Uh, And I think that would be true of any largely research-focused organization, like an academic institute or a research organization of sorts. But if you look at uh, philanthropic organizations, etc., they might have like a separate legal team uh, and a separate team to look at, I don't know, their website and marketing and things like that if they are focused on those things. So Operations would probably only include running the office smoothly, HR management of sorts. So I like to look at it this way, that historically operations, COOs were people who were the right hand person of the CEO, making sure that things happen while the CEO is focused on uh, some specific initiative or s- something where, where the, the CEO zoomed into something specific or trying to trying to be the be a thought leader in the industry. But but someone need to, needs to be focused full time on the fact that this is a company that needs to be Uh, working efficiently and effectively achieving whatever its stated objective is. So those were operations roles, people who would probably take up CEO ship after the CEO uh, in many companies, in many cases. And uh, yeah, people who were there to make sure that everything runs smoothly. So whatever then they controlled in order to make sure that that happens became operations. Like in e-commerce, it's supply chain and logistics that are ops. Uh, In for-profit companies, different functions become important enough or big enough that they are, they're siphoned off as their own departments sort of marketing and sales. And But in a research setup where it's about good research that needs to reach uh, policymakers or the larger populace and audience, anything that supports the core value chain of thinking the thoughts and putting them out there, uh, anything that supports this whole process is operations. So what things do you think people sometimes confuse for operations that, that you wouldn't classify that way? Yeah, so it might be useful to talk about this in the context of a specific type or or in the context of a specific industry or type of organization. So I think for EA orgs, largely what constitutes operations is uh, anything apart from like, let's say FHI's research case or some, some functions might be separate, but everything else that culminates into the organization 
delivering their core product or their core expertise to the people they want to reach out to, anything that facilitates that process is operations. Now, I think there is an important distinction uh, to be made, which I don't have the right uh, terminology for it. It's not very fleshed out uh, in my head or in the couple of people that I've spoken to this about, but there's something to be said about a distinction between what I would like to call administration and operations. So what I call administration is when you're dealing with a preset system that you don't control, that you can't innovate or radically overhaul, whether it's interacting with some government department that you have to push some forms through, some policy body that you have to engage with, and they uh, predate you by many decades and you know are set in their ways, and you have to play ball with their rules, get entrenched in their system, and then operate. So if you're doing something like that, I think that's largely administration, where economies of scale kick in by, because you're doing the same sort of tasks. You're doing fairly repetitive tasks uh, interacting with this system. And it's hard to uh, make this more efficient on your terms. So th- those are admin bits. And then a- everything else, making sure that the organization is very effective and even sort of figuring out how much of your workflow or a- anything that you're dealing with needs to be interacting with this maybe slower administrative setup uh, versus how much of it can you directly control and you know speed up or uh, change at will. Those decisions as well would be opt. So that's how I think uh, this community should be looking at operations, that there's an element of administration to it. And then there's an element of making things happen. So operations roles are the ones where there's a lot more opportunity for creativity and innovation and redesigning things, whereas administration is is once that stuff's kind of already been fixed in place, then you just need to go through the process that, that exists. Yes. Uh, at least I'd like to believe that that's the right way to make a distinction because then you can attract people who want to be creatively solving problems, dealing with putting innovative frameworks in place, thinking sort of out of the box, uh, willing to deal with a lot of rapid change testing. You can attract them to operations and then you can attract people who like to work with a system and like continuity and stability and have them do administration. So before we go on, we should probably give some examples of the kinds of roles that we're actually going to be uh, talking about in, in, in the rest of the interview, uh, so people can have a kind of a, a concrete vision of that. So the kinds of operations roles that people are looking to fill, things like the partnership on AI is looking for a chief operating officer, GiveWell is also looking for a director of operations, Ort is looking for a chief operating officer, Ort being uh, an AI forecasting group. The Open Philanthropy Project, who we interviewed uh, Holden from a couple of months ago, has been looking for a director of of operations, but they recently filled it with someone who had a senior role in the Hillary Clinton uh, campaign. Then there's a whole bunch of other roles. We've got the operations associate at Open Phil. I think they're still looking to fill that and, and a grants associate. The Future of Humanity Institute until recently was looking for a senior administrator. Berkeley Existential Risk Initiative is looking for a project manager. Uh, the Center for Applied Rationality is looking for a workshop operations lead. There's uh, really, really quite a lot of these. Uh, so the list, the list in our article goes on. We've got our Founders Pledge is looking for a personnel and development assistant. The Copenhagen Consensus is looking for an executive assistant. And there's, there's a bunch of other roles as well. I think uh, some of these might have been filled by the time this episode goes out. Uh, but they give you kind of a, a taste of the, of the positions that, that are available. Uh, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, just that how across the uh, spectrum of the board, like senior to junior, all sorts of vacancies are available for people who might, you know, think that they want to be trying their hand at ops kind of stuff. And uh, at FHI, we're also going to be opening more program manager sort of positions, like at least a couple of more program managers who I would say are like mid-level ops roles, which we'd like to fill with people who have some experience of project management under their belt already. So all sorts of roles in the community, operations focused, available, uh, depending on like if, if you think that you're going to be excellent at modeling someone's preferences, you've got executive assistant sort of roles open. If you think you have some experience and would be a good person to set the strategy and direction, you've got like director of ops sort of roles op- open for ought and give well and everything. So yeah. Yeah. Are there any other positions I didn't mention that FHI or the Global Priorities Institute might be hiring for in the next couple of um, months? I think Global Priorities Institute will hire for a head of research operations of some sort. FHI will also open a head of operations, a couple of program managers. Uh, We also would probably open another couple of executive assistants or or administrative assistant sort of roles. So yeah, in our organizational priorities, we are looking for uh, strengthening, bringing more hands on deck for our ops team. And it'll be kind of across the levels for now. So maybe three to four more roles from FHI and GPI only focused on operations, uh, three to five over the the course of this year. 
whenever this goes out, I'll stick up a link to our job board and the hmm. latest list of operations roles that, that are available in our, in our article about um, operations roles specifically. So people can check those out and see if there's any that they'd like to apply for now. So uh, just tell me more about what a COO does uh, relative to a CEO. So I guess a CEO is kind of setting the strategy for the organization and then the CEO, like, but then they don't have any time to actually make sure that it gets done. So the COO is the person who actually implements it? Yeah, I think a CEO is closer to the pulse of the organization than the CEO. CEO uh, of a large for-profit company might be focused on how to keep the stakeholders happy, mm. talking to a few of the key, key people rather than interacting across the board with a bunch of people, doing things like mergers and acquisitions or focusing on uh, expansion and so, sort of putting on these meta strategic level hats and thinking through how the next five years, 10 years or two to five years should pan out. Mm. Uh, the CEO, on the other hand, is very tuned into this uh, ideology, this direction, and then is trying to make it happen, trying to move step by step uh, the organization from where you're at and where you'd want to be two to five years from now, focused more on making that plan materialize while that plan is evolving. So uh, ideally, you would want to stay a couple of steps ahead of and have thought through contingencies and sort of things that could potentially go wrong uh, and proactively move in the direction that you want to move in, keeping in mind that that direction might change a little bit, which I think is something that, yeah, effective altruism is community. We've experienced a bunch of change and that change management. I think the COO is it, it's it's on their shoulders to do it smoothly, so to say, for the rest of the organization. So uh, are there any kind of particularly famous uh, COOs that uh, people working in operations kind of uh, look up to and admire or, or any kind of companies where operations was like particularly, particularly important to them getting dominance? Yeah, there's a lot of interesting literature if one tries to understand what are some of the cool things to be doing in operations and what are some of the strategies that have gone right. So at my talk at EAG, I talked about General Leslie Groves. Like, I think he's a very good example of an operations person who made like a sea of difference to the whole project, Manhattan Project, and was extremely instrumental in making some really uh, interesting things happen. Mm -hmm. And something is to be said about him as an individual there. I don't think it's a role thing. Someone else in that role uh, might not have been so effective. So it's it's his uh, buying into the project and his understanding of everything important and his ability to optimize things because he knows everything that's happening. Uh, something like that is inspiring. A lot of this has been studied for the corporate world. Like what are the best practices? What are the things that have worked? Some business case studies that are like HBR publishes a bunch of these case studies. So I think there are some very famous case studies of people in Dell, who've done interesting operational innovations. People in Walmart, I think Walmart introduced something like a cross docking. The, the minute the product comes in, it's sort of shipped out uh, to where it needs to finally be displayed on the shelf. So these are the kind of innovations that, or these are the kind of success stories you hear about ops, but it's a very interesting fact that operational innovation is the least tried form of innovation, like least doubled in form of innovation. Like I'm not sure sure about this, but yeah, I've, I remember having read this somewhere in some HBR article. That's where in, least innovation is attempted because it's not sexy. It's not it's not very glamorous to say that oh I've overhauled the whole process and look at these three small changes that are leading to I don't know 06 percent more efficiency or 06 percent less defects or 0.2 percent more engagement. It's hard to communicate the achievement. It's yeah. it's it's less fancy than I've acquired that or we've done this or we've done that. And it's harder to do because only very few people in an organization are equipped to take a look at everything that's happening and take a very meta systems level view of how to optimize. At least in larger organizations, that's harder. But there are a bunch of companies who've done very innovative things in operations, including companies like Uber, Toyota. Toyota Production Management System is like, it's known as Toyota Production Management System, which is like their whole expertise on how to run operations better now. So there's an element of efficiency to it. There's an element of innovation to it. The innovation is less. Uh, it's, it's harder to do. Fewer people are equipped to do it. And even after sort of massive innovation or something, very few, few people will appreciate what you've actually done. And it's less sexy to talk about. It's less glamorous to be boasting about 0.2% increase in something, something. I'll uh, try to stick up some links to, to some of these uh, different case studies. So yeah. There's the, like the Toyota just in time system, right? Where they yeah. figured out how they to have almost uh, store almost no inventory because everything was moving. Yeah, the Toyota's just in time system. Even Walmart's cross docking system was yeah. basically to make them inventory light so that they don't have to be storing all the products in one place and then some other container will come and they'll ship everything. 
Yeah, there was this <laughs> famous economics paper showing, uh, as I recall, that just the improvements in Walmart's logistics during the 90s, that alone mm. uh, drove like several percent of all the US economic growth. Yeah, Just wow. from like managing to like move a lot more products yeah. much more cheaply. Because it's, I mean, Walmart, I think, is the biggest retailer in the world uh, still. Yeah. Um, uh, and then I guess also this, did you have any other details on the, on the Manhattan uh, Project story? I, yeah. I was, as I understand it, the Manhattan <laughs> Project actually was absorbing several percent of GDP uh, during that of, time period. During that time period, and, yeah. and yet they still managed to keep it secret because people were making... Yeah. all of these materials. I mean, obviously, in effect, like a million people were working on it, but they just yeah. didn't know what they were contributing to. Yeah, it was run in a very siloed kind of way uh, to make sure that, yeah, it wouldn't leak out. It was supposed to be uh, secret. Much of it was supposed to be secret. So, which I think is a testament to how expertly was it managed, how tightly was it managed at some levels that all these other uh, bits and parts of it could afford to be so siloed and so unaware of what the other arm is doing. Yeah, so I think that was a masterful execution sort of case study, which I don't know too many details about, to be honest. Like, I've just yeah. heard about it. And I think, yes, yeah, that makes sense. That is one way of showing that a person who's not a scientist had like a great impact on a largely research project where he wasn't really equipped to have much of an impact mm-hmm. uh, if he stuck to find the facility, source the raw material, and then just step away, let the scientists do what they want to do. Uh, so he took initiative and was very proactive and uh, a bit of a taskmaster. So I think, yeah, he managed managed a great deal. While talking about innovations and operations or sort of case studies of ops work done well, I think the fact that CEO is often a stepping stone to becoming CEO in the corporate world goes on to show that heading operations prepares you for knowing what are the true business challenges. And uh, if you are such a person who sort of has deep knowledge about all the aspects of running the business, it's a very good position that primes you for uh, leading the organization in some way. So Tim Cook was a CEO uh, and Sheryl Sandberg's the CEO. And these are famous CEOs, you know, most companies don't have very famous CEOs Mm. just because uh, I think what they facilitate for the CEO is that CEO can become a media figure or become like a figure for the organization for people who are looking towards learning more about the organization and the CEO is a bit in the background and works and then some of them become famous because some of them do like extraordinary things yeah as I understand it, uh, Tesla doesn't have a COO, but I think I guess Elon Musk kind of fills that role as well. <laughs> or, or he's like he's like so so deep into the details, uh, being in the factory all the time that he kind of. Uh... I think they might be calling some things differently. Like it's it, it roles have fancy titles, director of X Y Z, but uh, there would be people who are focused on operations. Or it, yeah, I, I like I do know I've I've read in places that Elon Musk is very very hands on, so yeah. he might be doing many of those things himself. He might he might. M- I'm sure he has a team of people who are managing his projects and making sure that all the information is synthesized and right people are made aware of the right things. So that is the team that works with him, uh, his program director, project managers. Those are largely the people who are running the organization uh, in the sense that I think they are instrumental in making things happen, uh, making sure that Elon Musk's will is translated to the rest of the organization. Their feedback is fed back to him. So they are essentially the operations, um, whatever they call themselves. They might be calling mm. themselves something else. Yeah. Yeah. So let's let's uh, think about how relevant this stuff is, I guess, to existential risk reduction and the effective altruism community. I, I guess it, for, for organizations like the Against Malaria Foundation or um, Deworm the World or the Schistosomiasis Control Initiative, I mean, those are extremely operations heavy uh, mm-hmm. kind of projects. In fact, I mean, they're, they're almost mostly operations because they're about moving a product to people or distributing it, like checking it all. But yeah, for, for effective altruism, like movement building and so on, how relevant do you think these kind of big corporate case studies uh, are? Like, does, does it have that much in common? Probably not. Uh, probably not very relevant. I think there's some generalist sort of insights that you can cull out from failures, whether it's in a big organization or in a startup or in some public-private partnership sort of body. But beyond that, I think these organizations, which are focused on doing the most good, effective altruist organizations, are dealing with different problems. I'd also go so far as to say that these organizations are full of people who are very value-aligned and mission-aligned, which is kind of very rare Mm. uh, generally in the community. Generally in the corporate world, not everyone's rallying behind the cause with the kind of fervor and enthusiasm that effective altruists are for the causes that they care about in the organizations they're working for. In that sense, I think it's better. It's a better environment to be doing things because you're not wasting a lot of energy trying to bring people who should be on board, bring them on board. So you're not wasting effort there. So those case studies, insofar as they explain how to anticipate growth challenges, insofar as they talk about how to deal with things like 
uh, improving the culture of your organization or improving communication channels in your organization. I think one particular area where uh, the insights from the industry are particularly relevant is project management. It, it doesn't matter the kind of project that you're managing. Uh, there are some very good practices that you can adopt uh, to efficiently manage projects to make sure that you're minimizing uh, redundant work, uh, you're minimizing inefficiencies that are bound to creep in. So experience teaches you that, some best practices teaches you that. So you can uh, you can try and learn a little bit from all of that. But operations in the EA community are slightly different ball game, as is true for any industry, I would say. Okay, yeah, let's talk about uh, operations in, in effective altruism now. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we recently published this article, Why Operations Management is One of the Biggest Bottlenecks in Effective Altruism, which was, I guess, trying to lay out the case for something that uh, people that people inside um, the community, people working in these organizations were aware of, but I think most people outside of them uh, were not, which is just that we're struggling to grow. And one of the key reasons is just that we lack the, the operations capacity to, to, to make organizations function at a larger scale. So yeah, do you, you want to um, present a bit of a case of why you think operations can, can have a really large impact within organizations that are, that are doing something very valuable? Yeah. So if I talk about like my personal motivation for working in operations in this community is that the force multiplier argument that because economies of scale kick in, because if one person's dealing uh, with processes regularly and frequently, they're likely to know more about them and they're likely to be more efficient at it. Uh, you can free up a lot of um, Batman time and Batman is a proxy for whoever you think is amazing and needs to be doing more of what they are doing. Mm. So I like to think of, you know, uh, all the work that I put in uh, as an executive assistant to Nick as freeing up some of his time. Now, I would refrain from making like a qualitative assessment of quality of time that I free up for him. Like, I think effective altruism is full of uh, a lot of people who are very efficient, like they drink their meals and they listen to podcasts <laughs> at 3x speed while walking. So I'm not sure. <laughs> what's the value but I, I i definitely think that i reduce some level of decision fatigue some level of uh, sort of having to deal with administrative things that possibly uh, he doesn't want to deal with and possibly won't be uh, you know as efficient at dealing with because he's not dealt with them so taking away some of those things is the kind of uh, motivation for doing this from from my perspective so you can have like a turbocharge kind of effect on the mission that you're working towards so i think that's what's super motivating about working in operations. There is a dearth of talent of people. Uh, there's a dearth of interested and talented people who want to work in operations in these, this community. I think that's a temporary thing. Like I, when I say temporary, it's these are nascent organizations that are just growing. I don't think uh, the challenges that ops in these organizations face right now are such that an industry veteran with 25 years of experience is going to quit his job and come like he will see this as oh well you don't really need me we do need experienced people but the industry veterans don't think that they have much to gain from these sort of roles so we have uh, a bunch of people who are young excited unsure of what they want to do possibly operations might be useful i've heard it's high impact that kind of argument and then they come and try their hands at ops so that's the kind of talent that's available right now uh, I think more people are likely to see that these roles can be super important and then possibly we'll have more people come in. Yeah. Uh, and I'd also like to say, unless you want to become an AI safety researcher, I'm not sure how are you planning, uh, how do you plan to contribute if you want to contribute towards mm -hmm. making sure that these technologies come and they are used for the improvement of the world in general, like benefit of the world in general. So you could be a policy person or you could be a technical researcher or you could be someone who's making sure that uh, communication happens smoothly and all these uh, organizations work uh, well together. I think it's a it's a really good place to put yourself and absorb a lot of the information about uh, the cause area by osmosis, by learning, by reading, and making connections that are very valuable. You are connected. It's a, these are very small, tightly knit communities, so you get exposed. You get a lot of exposure talking to the people that you would prefer to talk to because you know you like working in these areas. So those are the things that should be the driving forces of people who want to work in operations in these fields. And I, I think it's important for people who want to do operations to want to continue to want to do operations. It's more to find those people rather than someone who will give two years of their life to ops. Because I think that's a slightly inefficient way of going about setting up systems that are scalable and are, are going to stay scalable and robust. So let's let's see if we can break down the impact into various different categories. So there, uh, first you were talking about the um, 
the fact that you can save the time of other people. So potentially, uh, you know, if you put in eight, in eight hours a day, then you can save like eight hours of everyone else's time by doing things that otherwise they would have to do. Potentially more than that, because uh, you, you can be focused on doing yeah. these things extremely well, whereas they would have to be, get distracted and yeah. waste the time. And then they've got to go do this one task that they don't really know how to do, and then they can go back to their work. And in as much as you're doing this kind of, try trying to amplify someone else's impact by saving all of their attention and their time so they can do the thing that they're really amazing at, uh, you're able to kind of shop around to find the highest impact person in the world basically who's willing to hire you uh, for, for that role so you're like incredibly flexible in that way uh, that, that potentially you want in, in some other roles so you think Nick Bostrom is extremely high impact and so you can go and work for him just directly and you know buy his time yeah I think that gives me so much satisfaction and joy to know that I'm freeing up some of Nick's time because I think uh, he's incredible at what he does and uh, more Nick time will lead to more more work that needs to happen happen and by possibly the best person who could be doing that work so that's a very inspiring uh, goal to run towards and uh, motivate myself with yeah it's interesting um people who are who are donating money uh, often get a bit frustrated because they can't find things to fund that they really like that aren't already funded so mm-hmm. someone like nick, nick bostrom usually isn't mm-hmm. limited by you know whether mm-hmm. uh, whether his salary can be paid mm-hmm. there's so many people yeah. are interested in funding him but there's other things you can provide in, in your case by providing skill you can you know you can allow you can buy more nick bostrom in yeah. a sense just by by f- filling in for these t- tasks that otherwise you'd have to waste his time doing yeah, yeah yeah and that's such a fascinating way of looking at it like uh it's a very intuitive argument once it's once it's made but i had to sort of see it like this to to, uh, buy into the fact that oh yes this is what I could be doing and this is really exciting okay so so there's the saving time hmm. uh, aspect there's also just the fact that from my experience I, I was the executive director of CA for a couple of years you just find like if operations can't scale then you just aren't able to hire or you just yeah. find that you're, you're kind of stuck you, you don't have the capacity to put in place the the processes to actually get the people who you need and even yeah. if you got them things would just become a mess very quickly yeah. so this thing of just like an organization can just get in the position where it can't hire people doing frontline work hmm. without the necessary operations in the background do you yeah. want to talk about that Yeah, I think if you don't have an ops team in place, uh, there's going to be inefficiencies that are, I think Malo or someone uses like this analogy of death by a thousand cuts, which I think Mm. is so accurate. So uh, someone or the other will need to be doing these things. So if someone wants a research assistant or an intern, they're going to go out and find someone themselves and try and bring them in the system, make mistakes and learn, reinvent the whole wheel. So if you don't have ops people or ops systems, someone will be doing some of these things. Just that's the nature of ops tasks that most of it needs to get done. Like if uh, CFAR needs to organize workshops and don't have the bandwidth of ops people to help organize them, then I don't know, Anna Salman will be organizing workshops. And it's it's a bit, it, it's that's not an optimum use of her time. That's not the most efficient way to go about these things. So Also, just to some extent, if the other staff don't know how to do it, then the events just don't happen. They just yeah. decide not to schedule them. Yeah, they or they'll enough. just let go of that work stream altogether, which is potentially worse. So yeah. even if you have ambition and if, if you have resources in terms of funding, etc., and you don't have the team that can execute on all of that, that can run the operations, you would A, not be able to scale, you know, to meet your ambition. Even if you do manage to sort of trudge along and scale somewhat because you absolutely need to, it's going to be inefficient. Uh, you're going to grow in ways that are uh, probably going to be problematic later on because there's no one who's synthesizing everything and consolidating everything when it needs to happen when you're growing up, uh, when an organization scales up. So I think uh, operations becomes really important uh, from that perspective that there's going to be like a thousand holes that sink your ship very gradually. And one day you'll realize that, oh, shit, now I'm in trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So it seems like as organizations, you know, move beyond the scale of just a couple of people who all know one another well, that operations becomes much more important and like really, really essential for the organization to function. What are kind of the challenges that organizations face as they go from being two people to 20 people? There's something to be said about when organizations go beyond friends and family, which is like 10, 15 people, very like minded, everyone with the capability to communicate directly with each other with very good communication channels. After you grow out of that and reach this Till the time you reach this 100, 150 people, 200 people scale, there's a lot of changes that come about that you have to deal with in a very systematic uh, and efficient way in order to not have staggering inefficiencies settle in in your organization. So I think that's where uh, the growing pains that all organizations have to deal with while they're scaling up. They're the ops challenges. Some of them, uh, some of them have common underlying features, uh, making sure that communication channels are smooth. Like I think operations is a function, especially in the EAX risk community, that should take responsibility for making sure that 
people aren't making decisions based on partial information, that relevant people who need to be consulted or informed about a project or a decision are, you know, they are in the know, they are being consulted on time. All the relevant opinions that need to be factored in are factored in on time. So someone needs to be uh, doing this task of being the central uh, person who's monitoring everything and informing the right people of the right things at the right time. And th- that's why I'm saying operations becomes really crucial. And I think, I imagine when you scale from, I don't know, 250 to 500 plus or 1000 plus, there's again, like a certain uh, hill that you have to climb, which is of a similar nature that scale up beyond that point will lead to some other things that you have to factor in. Some of your processes will break because they are not uh, robust enough to support like thousand plus people interacting with them or something like that. So, or you will have to put fairly new different processes in place. You might have to cultivate in-house capability for things like uh, recruitment and headhunting. Like you might need to have a recruitment specialist in-house, or you might need to have a person who deals with a, a bunch of recruitment consulting firms and that's their full-time job. And then they can figure out what are the good ones in the industry you can rely on, w- which are the ones which give you like leads that usually don't pan out into anything meaningful. So someone who can sort of focus on these specialized tasks and meanwhile, keeping the communication really strong and making sure that people aren't talking past each other. They have common knowledge and awareness about what they should know about about the organization. Okay, so uh, we talked about uh, two ways that op staff can have impact. One is uh, saving people's time. The other one is like allowing the organization to actually scale. Uh, I think that maybe there's a third one, which is like preventing catastrophes, because it is just the case that sometimes an organization can be significantly brought down uh, by a fa- by a failure within operations. Yeah. I know of I know of one case uh, where uh, an operation staff came in and basically pre- saved the organization from failing very quickly because hmm. they noticed that uh, someone was embezzling money and and, oh, wow. and, and put hmm. a stop to that uh, yeah. right away. Uh, which otherwise basically would have meant that the organization uh, was out of money and would have folded. Did you think that's another large route to impact? Yes, I think you're absolutely right there uh, because your job is to keep an eye on all the balls possible and make sure that you're aware of everything that's happening and all the directions in which your people in the organization are pulling the organization in, so to say. You are best placed to point out uh, potential problems in the future, things that are uh, not optimal to be doing given the objective or the goal of the organization. So you're in a very good spot to be able to point out any and all of that. So from that perspective, that is something that you can have a huge impact on by being able to sort of clarify the mission or define uh, define some useful systems and processes or useful directions for the organization to be focusing on also, or just to be able to look at where you are and where you're headed and say that these are the things that we should definitely avoid. These are the challenges that we should definitely avoid. And I think experience of having done ops preps you well for that because failures teach you a lot. Uh, And it's not to say that, oh, well, then let's go out and fail 500 times because then we'll end up learning a lot of lot of things. But that's where seasoned ops people, I think, help an organization, especially because they tackle this third aspect very head on, because they bring in experience that leads to them having sort of better instincts about how to grow or what to watch out for or what to, uh, you know, be very mindful and cautious about while moving in a particular direction. You work for a week, I say. How many weeks of research or time uh, do you get out of a, a week of your time? So, like, through these various different avenues. So, one is, you know, saving, saving people's time by, by taking things off their plate. Another is, like, allowing the organization to have more people in it just by making the ops run uh, function so you can hire more. Do you have any sense of, like, whether the, is there kind of a, a, a multiplier that you can give here? I try and track all of this for my very unique situation at any given point in time. But I really don't think that I have a enough insight into effective altruism as a community and what all goes on in all the different roles that people are expected to play. B, enough insight into decision because I think how an organization distributes its decision making power Mm. leads to a lot of uh, what can which people in the organization impact like if you empower roles significantly then they can make like a disproportionate impact on things so there the second point that we talked about that if you're able to make things run smoothly you can hire quickly Mm. you can scale up faster so that's like that's very tangible direct uh, number of research hours added or saved kind of calculation that you can do but on, on the time you free up I think I, in my EAG talk, had talked about uh, freeing up an hour of Nick Bostrom's time every day, roughly saying there's 30 minutes of it is, you know, something that would have required him to execute his decision capacity. Mm. Those are very hand wishy-washy, hand wavy numbers. Uh, I'm not sure. He's a fairly efficient guy who would have uh, figured out a way to do all these things on the fly while drinking his liquid meals. <laughs> yeah. So there are also people who are not very good at these things and probably would not have. So I'm not going to name names, but when I just joined FHI, 
I was setting up installing a new printer for like a bunch of the people and this researcher and I spent like two hours trying to install the printer on his laptop, his Windows yeah. laptop. Two hours of his time solidly yeah. wasted uh, <laughs> because I was massively incompetent at trying to do this. Like I couldn't figure out what's the issue with this. Something like that can happen. It's, it's a very person dependent thing. Yeah. But yes, I'd like to believe that because all the information rests with me and I'm used to doing these things and they're more in my skill set than in researcher skill sets or in the skill sets of academics. I can free up more than eight hours of FHI researcher level time per day. Yeah. Uh, so I think that's fair to say, especially if you're responsible for like 10, 12 people, if the ops to researcher ratio is one is to 10, one is to 11, uh, or for a time one is to 20, the kind that was in FHI while I was the only one around. Uh, yeah, I was able to free up more than uh, one researcher. Yeah, that's day. that's what I would imagine. Yeah. It's like potentially you could get yeah. a several fold multiplier yeah. depending on yeah what the ratio is. Yeah. Of the... yeah. And on the third aspect where if you can avoid uh, massive inefficiencies, if you can avoid crash and burn or sinking of some part of the organization completely because you know there's operations are not run well it's harder to figure out what the counterfactual is there like what what could have would have been done what have you avoided is something you don't know possibly nothing but yeah all of that's a bit hard to calculate i think it's easier to do it for your own role with the complete understanding that you have the ecosystem you function in but across the community as operations as a function matures and as more people are focused on trying to do this more effectively we'll know more and discover more i think yeah so some people uh think yes operations roles are are very valuable but they also believe that it it should just be easy to hire mercenaries basically to do this that we Hmm. should just outsource all these functions to kind of some external uh, firm like kpmg Hmm. or just just hire people who are not Hmm. interested in effective altruism don't really care about the mission you don't believe that we can do that and and neither do i uh, but, but why is that I want to be fairly epistemically modest here and say that I really don't know what's the best way. But I I personally think that for someone to stick around for a long time with an organization, it's important that they are happy with their job and they're content with their job. And I personally have struggled to find contentment even when I was working with a person I really respected. I liked uh, most of my team. I I think the work was challenging. So there was a bunch of, I was paid really well. Uh, I was given all sorts of incentives to stick around and autonomy. All those hygiene factors were sort of checked off for me, but I wasn't happy. Yeah. So I think value alignment brings that contentment, that satisfaction. When you're working with an organization for a really long time, you're going to hit low times as well. There will be times when you're at odds with like mostly everyone in the organization or you feel differently and other people feel differently or you feel that uh, something should be done differently, whereas it's being done wrong. Like you're going to have all sorts of moments and uh, not having a crisis of faith then is sort of boils down to how much do you believe in the overall mission that you're working towards is it all meaningful to you or is it just a job that you're you know trying to earn and maybe earn to give or something but basically that's what it essentially I think boils down to and that's where I think value alignment becomes really important you're not going to feel isolated or alienated effective altruists have like a very typical way of talking we're talking about the same things we're obsessing about the same problems someone who's not a part of this community is going to find that very annoying all the time that what are you guys on and on about like if they're not bought into that way of thinking uh, how urgent all of this is they're going to be fairly isolated in the whole setup is my sense and they're also not going to work with the kind of urgency they're not going to be appreciative of the urgency of others so i think in operations roles it's important to have value aligned people who want to stick around so that you can grow these people as operations leaders Mm -hmm. i think when an employee churns out there's a lot of institutional information tacit knowledge relationships that are lost that leave with that person Mm -hmm. so for the health of the organization it's important to grow people who have long-term careers in operations but obviously there are also some roles where it's where it's all right if you don't have someone who's you know, bleeding for the cause or ready to bleed for the cause uh, or like a fanatic. It's all right to have some people who like working in a nice team, nice office environment, derive pleasure from the fact that they are, you know, checking off 15 things off their to-do list every day, uh, keeping all these wonderful people happy, are doing something that they enjoy and are hanging around in an environment that they enjoy. So I think it's all right to have those uh, those roles be filled by people who are not necessarily that values line. There needs to be a certain level of appreciation for what effective altruists or whatever organization that they're trying to do. They can't be opposed to the idea of whatever you're doing, mm. but they don't necessarily need to be absolutely bought into. They can be exploring, they can be interested. And even if they churn, they don't take away uh, sort of important information that 
presents itself as sort of solid loss later, I feel. So I do feel that senior roles of in operations should be filled only by value-aligned people because yeah. decision-making and decision trade-offs uh, would be pretty impossible to understand or appreciate like the other people if, if you are on some other uh, trajectory or tra- tangent of what is important and what is not. Yeah, I mean, that raises another issue that because it's so important for more senior staff who have a more strategic role to, yeah. to share the values, if you hire someone who doesn't, then oh. you basically can't promote them. And also, and you can't like yeah. move them, in, but you can't move them um, horizontally either. Yeah, and it has a trickle down effect on the rest of the team as well. Like if they're not aligned to the values of the organization, not bought into uh, to a very healthy and sort of largely to the extent that's needed, then the team that's functioning under them uh, and executing on the operations uh, strategy under them is also going to be somewhat confused. Uh, their incentives are going to vary a bit because their leader is in- incentivizing something else and their organization largely is incentivizing something else. What's the uh, best argument for uh, effect, you know, interest in the cause not being necessary for working in, in operations? So since it's easy to understand what are the kind of skills and mindsets that you need to be effective in your role in operations, like a good project manager uh, who's always worked in some different industries, does not care about what, what's happening here, and also maybe thinks that, okay, whatever, maybe n- not the most important thing or whatever, but fine, I'm in Oxford or I'm in the Bay and let me g- give these jobs a shot. If they're really good at what they do, uh, if they've been super successful in the past and past record has, it has a bearing on your ability to be able to assess whether they'll be good, specifically in the environment that you're, uh, you know, presenting them with. So uh, if you want someone to be able to accomplish things fast, you know, move fast and break things kind of mentality, then you have to look at someone who's done project management in the tech startup kind of space. So if they've been successful, if they come with strong recommendations of being a reliable, safe pair of hands who can execute things and has has a good ability to uh, pick things up quickly whenever needed. So if you can find someone like that, then maybe they can work well. So how about outsourcing these operations tasks to kind of external professional services firms or, you know, just, uh, just a bookkeeper who you find on the internet? Yeah, there's lessons to be learned about outsourcing from the industry in general, uh, where I think there was a trend towards bringing all sorts of expertise in-house in the 70s and the 80s, where you had these massive MNCs come up on the scene who were trying to leverage economies of scale, but had become like very clunky and non-flexible organizations that could not respond agilely to any situation. And then you had, then you also have these consulting firms that take away the cognitive aspect of ideating on a better solution or just the execution aspect of something like a payroll management or visa processing for you. And that's what they specialize in. Economies of scale are on their side. So you just engage with them on very specific, you know, narrow domains that they have expertise in. So in the EA community as well, there's a lot of similarity in the kind of things that come under operations for all different EA orgs. Like a bunch of them are dealing with processing visas for people they are hiring. Like that's across the board, a commonality that everyone's having to face. Or since there are so many not-for-profits, then there's some policy implications that you have to follow. There's some organizations, uh, companies, houses, etc., that you have to definitely deal with. So those are common things that everyone's dealing with. And as the industry matures, it makes sense to centralize these uh, things that can be handled well by one organization supporting many organizations rather than everyone reinventing the wheel and and, you know, not being able to learn off of each other's mistakes or experiences. So I think something like uh, a berry getting set up is, is an example of some, some semblance of centralization outside your organization for things like visa processing or for things like uh, dealing with a bunch of contractors, copy editors on request that they can do, which you as an organization, like every organization can't have an army of people Uh, on standby only to be pulled in or activated when they're needed. But uh, an outsourced company that's doing this for 15 organizations can. So I think we will see one, two, three organizations emerging that will help all the EA orgs with some set of services, which are very like the 70% of the solution is already there. 30% needs to be customized. This will not happen for very specific, specific to your organization problem. It will happen mostly for things that are outsourceable, but 
this has happened in the industry, likely to happen in the EA space as, as well. But I think it's it's a bit early for that, according to me. I think everyone's just trying to figure out things. And uh, there are some things where uh, this is already happening. Uh, but yeah, the scope of those things is fairly limited right now, likely to increase more in the future. Even so taking away total HR management, financial management, all aspects of that, many aspects of that, like up to 80% can be outsourced away. Yeah, do you think, I don't know, my experience with outsourcing things is that it can create a lot of kind of communication frictions uh, and like that the external group doesn't always understand exactly what you want. Yeah, I, I, have yeah. your experiences with outsourcing been positive? Or? Yeah, my experience with outsourcing or at least my observation of it, that has been positive in the sense that if, if it's run well, then, uh, or if it's run with the uh, appropriate caveats in mind, uh, then it's useful. So if you're trying to outsource something that's very core to what you're trying to like, FHI can't outsource research. That's it. You can only outsource something that's not really mission critical. That's not, like It's critical for that thing to happen for your mission to succeed, but that thing in, a, in of itself is not very mission critical. So for those bits, you can have one person in the organization whose duty it is to uh, interact well and communicate preferences and communicate back contingencies and issues that might come up with that organization to which you're outsourcing things. But it's important to have like a strong relationship that one person owns and holds and is responsible for with that organization or that outsourced entity within your organization and try and control that outsourced entity and what you want from it through that one person. Now you're right, doing something in-house with people who are 100% on the same page as you is very different from like people who somewhat understand what you're doing. But again, if it's like the administratory work, then you can do it Mm -hmm. with people who are not necessarily mission aligned, but they have service level agreements that they are going to adhere to and give you, you know, finished product deliverable within the time frame that you're looking for. And as long as it's not, uh, as long as they don't need to be value aligned uh, for that, uh, and it, it falls in somewhat the administrative bucket of things that we talked about, I think it should be fine. So presumably you've had to hire other people working within operations before. Do, do you find usually that the, the best applicant is significantly better than the second best applicant and the second better than the third? Is it is it like widely distributed capability? Uh, not in the experience that I've had. Like I hired my team in Snapdeal. So I hired basically project managers whose jobs it would have been to uh, communicate with the automobile organizations, do the marketing, handle the launches, so to say, of, uh, you know, some new scheme that we would have launched. Yeah, some applicants stand out and uh, you're very tempted to hire them. I think interviewing someone, it becomes very clear how well you would be able to work with them. And I think that two people are working closely together or even uh, when I say closely together, some manager and managee kind of thing, spending a bunch of time interacting on how to call out the best solution possible. So some brainstorming. So any working relationship of that sort, I think it's important that they are able to work well together. And it's a very personality sort of thing like one can say that people are mature enough to appreciate you know different styles and still be able to work in lockstep with each other uh, without talking past each other or you know um, miscommunicating and things like that but I, I find it like you need a special level of maturity to hit mm. that with two people and more often than not you find a very inadequate uh, situations equilibriums where people are not very happy are sort of gritting their teeth and continuing on along and uh, don't appreciate that they have very different working and managing styles mm. so from that perspective i feel uh, it's important to be able to figure out whether the person you're interviewing or considering is going to work well with you uh, th- this is not to say that, you know, presuppose that your working style is awesome and everyone needs to align to that. Uh, if they bring a special skill on board, I think it's important for managers to keep uh, evolving, to be quite flexible in their ability to work with different sorts of people. Some people need more direction. Some people need more elbow rooms and more space to be able to do things. But yeah, amazing ops people do stand out a little. If you're very confused whether I should be hiring someone or not, it's probably better to not hire them uh, than take that bet. Um, If you have the luxury to trial, test, uh, do sort of uh, one or two month trials, that's, I think, the best way to figure out how good, bad would they be? How, yeah, how they respond to feedback. I think those are the things that I personally look for. Like a person should be willing to take feedback on board. Uh, they should be excited about making things happen uh, in the sense that they should be like doers. And you can see this in the background story of a person. If they've been 
uh, often the person who's tried to make something happen and, you know, gone outside the remit of their role and responsibility. Those are uh, things that I appreciate. And then I think I appreciate drive a lot. Uh, this experience has its values, its merits, and I, I really value that. But if someone's extremely driven, then I think, yeah, I'd, I'd place my money on that candidate. So how much do people in operations uh, get to set the strategy of an organization? I think this is one thing that people worry is that if they're in an ops role, that they'll just have to hope that the organization as a whole is heading in the right direction because they won't be able to control it. Again, I think that would depend on the organization, also the individual. Like, I think my experience of working with FHI is that roles like executive assistant to a, a person who's directing an effort or an institute, uh, I think those roles, while Yes, your primary responsibility is to make sure that all of this administrative and operational work is off of that person's plate. But you are getting an insight into how they think and make decisions. You're briefing them on whatever is relevant for them to know and seeing the decision making process uh, real time. And you're also doing this with other key stakeholders in the organization. So if you have important things to contribute and if you have a good grasp of the subject matter uh, which is not to say the research subject matter, like a lot of these decisions, a lot of the decisions that FHI has to take on uh, a month to month basis does not have to do with our research direction. That's largely clear to the researchers. They're pursuing those trajectories. It's more to do around what to promote, where to do outreach, uh, how much to focus on marketing or outreach or website versus how much to focus on something else, uh, how to run HR processes more smoothly, how to hire faster or how to move offices into a new, like what are the things that we should be mindful of while we're scaling up over the next three, four years. So mm. these are organizational sort of day-to-day -day functioning level decisions. Some of them are more in the future. Some of them are more day-to-day. -day. We can only hire for three roles over the next three months. So which three roles while we want to choose from our pick of 10. So these kind of decisions where I think being in operations, you your job is to figure out what are the considerations that people keep in mind. What are the things that you need to make them aware of? Like basically making them aware of the things that they should know and then modeling their preferences and stepping into those shoes. So I like to believe that even if I'm not an instrumental part of making a decision, I'll uh, place my bet in my head and see where it's going. So I think yeah. it's a good way to keep honing that skill and also start contributing, um, like give your two cents. So while you're laying down, while you're making sure that there's efficient communication of all the important information, you can always add in a couple of lines of what you think is uh, the right thing to be doing. And I think therein you become a part of the decision making process. If ops is not a part of the decision making process or the day to day decision making that an organization has to do. And I would say that 60 percent of the decisions that are org level that affect the whole organization, 60, 70 percent uh, are in this category where there needs to be safe from someone who is handling the ops, handling the execution of things. Yeah. And if you are not involved in that then I think something's going wrong. And this is not to say the whole ops team should be involved in that, but like there should be some representation from operations in those op in those decisions. And I do see that happening at FHI. I'm not sure about other organizations, but I'd be very surprised if that's not the case. Yeah. Do you have any good stories of uh, things going wrong when operations is uh, done poorly or they haven't been able to hire the, the necessary people? Yeah, like I think it's less interesting, but the biggest problem that ops not being done well or being under uh, capacity or overburdened is that you're not able to hire people quickly. There's two elements to hiring. A, doing the everything that's required to sort of release a role, promote it, et cetera, et cetera, and get the person on board. So running those processes. And the other element is making sure that you have an applicant pool that you're excited about because at FHI, oftentimes we've run a recruitment process, but ended up sort of not hiring anyone from it. Mm. Uh, and th that's a situation where all the effort from an org perspective has gone into executing a process, but nothing has come out of it. So essentially, it's a waste of everyone's time. Mm. So it's equally important to be focused on making sure that if you are you're running the recruitment process for a role, you have some applicants that you're really, really excited about. And like at least three, four, five applicants where you think that, uh, it would be surprising if none of them get the job. So not doing that leads to things that you've done and are sort of leading to nothing. There can be, I'm sure there are many examples of sort of legal troubles cropping up because uh, you're not careful or aware or you haven't preempted all the things that you needed to possibly uh, because you're, you know, learning by doing kind of thing. And in the industry, I'm sure it, like, there must be very many examples. My own personal failures I can talk about in Snapdeal where uh, I was learning to set up a process, running sort of A-B tests on the product and 
the way I used to run the tests in the beginning and the way I used to run the tests after two and a half months of running tests was really different. Mm. And I could have gathered much better data. There were trajectories of wrong development on the product that I made everyone follow <laughs> because... Yeah, because I wasn't doing a good enough job of thinking through what what the end product should have. So I think I will couch all of them in a very hand baby way as operational inefficiencies or like failures of that. But it's essentially an ops person not doing their job as well as they can potentially do, which is not to say that they don't want to. Like it's mm. it's just hard to figure out the perfect secret sauce for your organization, especially when multiple stakeholders are involved. Mm. I think those situations become fairly tricky. Like I was working with seven or eight different teams and then coordinating and aligning all the ducks. I know that I learned that by trial and error, by failing and, you know, improving. So in the initial phase where I was learning, I personally led to a lot of inefficiencies (laughs) because I was learning. Uh, Sometimes you hear people complain that there's kind of too much uh, operation in their organizations that perhaps processes have been created where they don't have to be created and this is just uh, excessive administrative overhead. What do you think of that? Is it possible to join an organization and add too much ops capacity? Yeah, I think uh, in the realm of possibilities, that definitely seems possible. Just as you can have too few people looking at these things, you can also have too many people looking at these things and uh, too many cooks spoiling the broth kind of situation. That's yeah. sort of most definitely possible. And it's it's also not clear to me which is worse. Mm. <laughs> that might as well be worse because you're adding far more overhead than there needs to be. Uh, There's over analysis, there's analysis paralysis and sort of things aren't getting done because too many decision makers are trying to pull uh, the organization in different directions. So there there is a sweet spot or or a sweet range of, uh, you know, number of ops people that an organization of a certain size and scale should have. And again, it's, it's tricky to figure out. I don't know what good should that be for EAOGs it's too early to say there's a, there's a bunch to be discovered there, but being ineffective because of too many people trying to do uh, operations and introducing systems and processes almost for the sake of it is definitely f- highly suboptimal. Yeah, I guess my impression is that kind of none of the none of the organizations that I'm familiar with are like this because they they find it like hard to hire op staff rather rather than trivial to I don't know to accumulate too many. Yeah, I don't think the EA organization suffer from like the too many problem right now, but <laughs> yeah. they could in the future. Could happen, they, yeah. they don't right now. There seems to be this phenomenon that people who are good at ops uh, don't realize how much better they are than other people and they just assume that everyone else can, can do these things as well when they can't. Do you have any explanation for, for this phenomenon? I definitely think it's true. I don't have an explanation. A lot of ops tasks seem to be uh, ones where you have to uh, dive in, do the work, get your hands dirty kind of thing. So if you aren't comfortable with the lack of knowledge and awareness of what Pandora's boxes might open and, you know, uh, what what might you have to deal with? So unless you have that risk-taking appetite to some degree, you're going to wait for some expert to come and do the job. So I think a bunch of ops people are very good generalists and it's hard to appreciate generalist kind of skills like it's it's easier to say that yeah, I'm really good at x but I, I don't know what am I good at like I, I find it hard to say like I think I'm I can handle some sorts of things all right mm. I don't think I'm particularly smashing at any one thing mm. uh, and then if you say it like that it's it's a weird underconfidence sort of statement to make but <laughs> I've seen ops people often be a bit confused about what what is the magic they are pulling because there is no magic to it so it's very mm. systematically attacking problems committing to doing things, experimenting a bit, like tr- trying a few things, seeing what works. Oftentimes it's figuring out what's the best thing to be done. Y- you don't know it, but some other person might yeah, hit upon that insight. So just making a few calls, knocking on a few doors and assimilating information. None of it sounds like, I don't know, expertise. Like I don't think I'm great at gathering information, but that's essentially what I'm doing most of the time. So mm. I don't know what to credit myself for. And I think that's what a lot of ops people face. And they're like, oh, I don't know. I don't know if I'm doing anything special. I'm just doing these things. And I don't know what is special about it. Yeah. Yeah. I want to try to figure out what the explanation for this is. I mean, <laughs> when you were saying it's about being a generalist, it could be that if, if someone who's very good at operations is like good at everything, then kind of they never look outstanding. And, and you don't. Mm. And when you look at them doing one task, you don't appreciate that. In mm. fact, they're amazing because they're good at mm. such an, like tons of other stuff that they're not doing mm. in that precise moment. Yeah, uh, possibly. Or also in the same way in that a bunch of these tasks are not the kind of things that 
you applaud on the annual celebration day of your organization or the kind of things you talk about in media they're like mm. minor incre- incremental improvements that you're bringing in day to day or some pivotal shifts where operations is definitely not the only sort of function responsible so everyone comes together there's collective buy in to change directions and then you change that direction so uh, none of the ops tasks are very you can't attribute to them a lot of credit for having uh, shifted gears or change directions or uncovered some things that could have gone wrong it's a very uh, organic incremental happens behind the scenes largely it's it's a complex three dimensional territory that needs to be charted and it's difficult to project like a very compelling two dimensional picture in an article or a blog post or an interview about what is so awesome about it so it behooves ops people yeah. <laughs> to be a bit more humble and say that <laughs> don't know what are we doing that's magical but the idea is to keep things running efficiently and uh, that's what we bring to the table yeah i think another explanation might be that uh, they're doing something that other people could do in principle but they'll just do it a 50th as fast or they yeah. do it in a way less systematic way like they wouldn't automate it so they'd have to spend you know hours yeah. and hours doing something that they would automate and then like manage to get done in minutes yeah and perhaps that differs from perhaps you know other people couldn't have come up with the theory of relativity or something like that yeah um, exactly it, it wasn't just that um, einstein was like 50 times faster than me at doing yeah. it but it, you can't just hire 50 op staff to do a job and need to be very slow because then you've created yeah. this enormous communications yeah. overhead. It would be worse than having no one. Yes. Uh, so like the only operations people who are worth having are people who are like extremely fast and get tons of tasks done very quickly and automate it all. Yeah, I think that's a very, very good way of putting it. All right, let's push on to talking about uh, what you actually do, uh, operations kind of kind of day-to-day in your job. So yeah, is it possible to break down what do you spend your, your time on Yeah, in, in a given week? Yeah, sure. So a bunch of my time goes into uh, delivering on the requirements from my role as executive assistant to Nick. Uh, So there I'm churning through his email. I'm trying to figure out uh, what his preferences are, whether it's for things like travel or whether it's for engagement with media or taking on uh, some interviews uh, and things like that. So I'm communicating with those people and making sure that there's no uh, communication overhead for Nick for them. Then trying to figure out what are uh, some of the things that he needs get done on a day-to-day basis. So it's about basically rising up to the challenge of whatever... Uh, are his requirements and and bringing in an element of proactivity to it if you can giving him more time more freedom from sort of these things that are bothersome about the fact that you work within systems and with other organizations so part of my time is spent doing that and then I'm also handling some sort of projects for FHI where we have scale up plans so putting together a growth plan making sure the stakeholders are aware of what uh, plan we've put together keeping everyone informed feeding that information to Nick so how we function is I spe- uh, Nick makes his smoothie or elixir he likes to call it every day in the morning where he's sort of blending together vegetables to drink uh, so I brief him on his email I brief him on updates on other priority projects that are going in the organization where he uh, either wants to know what's happening or wants to give his two cents and, uh, you know, pass on along something that he thinks that the team should think about or be aware of. So something like that. Then there's there's a couple of other projects where we're launching a training program. So I'm trying to help with uh, dealing with anything that needs to happen for that, communicating with Oxford University for that. Hopefully we should find like a keeper, like a full-time person to, to drive that. We're planning to shift offices later this year or early next year. We're moving into a much larger office space. So going through the university, uh, all the all the different committees that we have to present our case to, you know, setting up the financial plan for that. Um, so focusing on some projects, some discrete projects like this. Also figuring out how or helping figure out along with other people, uh, what are the trade-offs that FHI should be making in terms of its hiring. There's a bottleneck in the number of people you can hire, which is because of the bandwidth that the university people who we tag team for these processes can give to this and the internal bandwidth crunch that we have. So what are the next roles that we should be hiring on? Uh, What are the things that we should be focused on? Uh, Because now we're growing a new ops team in place where FHI has also undergone some restructuring recently. So how to make sure that all different parts of the organization are seamlessly speaking to each other. So yeah, just focusing on some of these things. So how much involvement do you have in, say, grant applications or dealing with donors? Does that come up as well? Yeah, dealing with donors comes up every now and then, whether it's about giving them an update about an existing grant and how we're using that money. I think uh, this year, all the annual updates, etc., for the donors that we give annual updates to was sort of handled by me. There's also a university team whose full-time role it is to be sort of dealing with donors and uh, 
giving them the information they need. So communicating with that team, being the point of contact uh, for them, uh, making sure that our donors have everything that they uh, need at the end of the year, the satisfaction of, you know, knowing what happened with their money, how was it spent, what impact came out of it, and getting on call with donors in case they want to ask something, or even reaching out to them proactively in case we want something from them. So all of those are elements, but infrequent elements, like it, it's not a part of my day-to-day job, just because it's not like a very regular ongoing activity. It happens once or twice with every donor annually kind of thing. So it sounds like originally you were hired just to be uh, Bostrom's executive assistant, but then you've ended up doing like many different things. And this seems like a pretty typical story uh, for operations staff. Uh, Actually, originally I was uh, just brought in as a temporary administrator uh, and uh, Neil Bauman then uh, sort of uh, handed off the reins of some of these things, some of these sort of projects to me. And then, yeah, then there was this thing of how to keep me here. I'm on a like... my partner's here and I'm able to work in the UK because of his visa. Then we were able to open like uh, executive assistant to Nick sort of position. But yeah, I, I think I have sort of delivered across multiple roles just because we did not have people filling those roles. And now that we have like four people, possibly we'll have, we should be opening three more ops roles this year if everything goes right. Uh, so yeah, we'll have like more hands on deck and then I'll ha- probably have somewhat of a more defined uh, role. But right now, yes, uh, it, it's hard to explain why am I doing all sorts of these. Uh, yeah, why am I wedged in so many different types of projects? Uh, but it, it was need based more than anything else. Mm. Yeah, I guess my, my impression is that this this isn't that uncommon, though, at least in the organizations yeah. that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Uh, perhaps it's because they're smaller and so each person is yes. less specialized. So you only have so many staff and so kind of someone spends a third of their time on hiring and a third yeah. of their time on kind of uh, you know, making you know the, the office moving project and yes. things like that. Um, but there's there's no one person who's dedicated to like each each thing only. Yeah, the organizations are smaller. I think this is also how much initiative you take is sort of directly res- proportional to how much work you end up doing and how many different things you end up handling. Uh, I, I call this scope creep of work. Like yeah. you have a defined scope and then that creeps and creeps and creeps and becomes larger. Except Mercer, where I was learning how to do a job. It was my first job. I've done this in every organization. I was hired to do something. I ended up doing like a bunch of other things. I have a tendency to get wedged. I think... People who are doing operations in this community are all doing operations because they they think that these things should be done and are important. And that's why all of them have this trait of, oh, well, that needs doing. Can I do it? Uh, Or can I help facilitate doing that? Because, you know, that needs doing. So Mm. I think that mindset may makes you leverage your skills even where you don't necessarily know what to do but because you want to do it and there's not many other people and these are smaller organizations you have the liberty to take that initiative and uh, test waters and you know use that hidden trial methodology a bit yeah do you find the fact that you're working on a lot of different things appealing uh, is it like is the diversity enjoyable or does it mean that you just like feel split too many different ways on any given day, I'd tell you the diversity is like what makes it special, it brings it flavor. Uh, it makes sure I'm sort of learning new things constantly. And that illusion of intellectual progression is very important for a person like me. But every now and then, I'd like to say maybe with the frequency, like once a month, you'd find me in a place where I'd be like, I cannot do anything because, you know, my attention is split across 18 things. And more than attention being split, I think, there are some things where you need to take like a strategic overview of all the little bits and pieces and try and do a very meta level systems level thinking. Mm. And there are some things where you need to be focusing on, you know, the most nuanced thing and trying to do that or execute something on that. So I personally find this zoom in and zoom out across uh, different tasks during a work day or a work week at times challenging, I'm not very efficiently able to zoom out or zoom in or sort of give anything the kind of mind space it deserves. I stepped back and I thought about, is it useful if I do more things at 80% efficiency or less things at 100% efficiency? Mm. And I thought that the former was more useful. Could be wrong. I'm not very confident about that, but I decided to do like more with compromising on quality Mm. a little bit. And obviously keeping most of my focus on the top five, six important things and then tackling the tail end in a very quick and dirty way. What are some of the things that you've accomplished in your career, either at FHI or before that, that you found uh, really satisfying? Uh, In every job that I've held, I think till the time that I was doing that job, there were elements of satisfying things that, you know, were motivating to me and that kept me going. So watching your solution be 
put to good use or materialize in in the form of a process that that organization commits to following in my consulting days or with Snapdeal. Those are extremely uh, sort of satisfying things uh, to witness that people are interacting with the process that you've helped create, co-create, put in place. So uh, that leads to a bit of a, a yeah feeling of satisfaction of sorts. I found later in hindsight that it was temporary uh, unless it's sort of all adding towards something that you really really care about uh, it fizzles out the satisfaction that you get by hitting your monthly pnl or uh, you know making a great hire those are all things that give you somewhat of a kick somewhat of a yes this is awesome kind of a feeling yeah and and it has differed so i think big wins would be i think i was very proud when i was running like a big pnl Till the time I was not proud of it. So it was very, <laughs> there have been some transitions in that process, but having opened uh, and run five recruitment processes with FHI, six recruitment processes with FHI, sort of tracking that, knowing that that needle's moving, more people who want to be researching on these things, more awesome people who we can find and bring in our orbit. I'm facilitating that process. There's There's a lot of satisfaction in that. I personally find it very satisfying to know that if on the rare occasion I can sort of uh, premeditate Nick's requirements and make sure that I he's equipped with what he needs to be equipped with while making even a certain decision and things like that. So being able to do that, it, there's like a very day-to-day level of satisfaction in knowing that you're improving there. So could you just give a kind of a quick summary of what are the key characteristics that um, make someone a good fit for operations roles? Sure. Um bit hard to sort of boil it down to only very few. Uh, Also don't want to launch into too many. So I'll try and put out what I think are super important characteristics or traits that mostly all good ops people or most of the good ops people have. I think one would be a bias towards action and making sure that you're tabling good solutions. Uh, Basically tabling solutions. And the second part that follows is tabling good solutions. So being the person who feels very unsettled if things are broken. So rather than just complaining about them, you'd probably throw yourself at it and patchwork it somehow. I think that's a very useful quality. That's very Also, that's very easy to see if someone has consistently displayed it because you'll find it in the kind of things they've done in their school. You'll, you'll see it in if they were instrumental in organizing any events uh, in their college, uh, community building kind of stuff. You'll also see it in their work. It sort of shines through this quality and I think it's very important. Then the second thing I would be uh, sort of psyched about seeing in ops people is, yeah, the excitement to learn different things and not be very settled in their jobs already. Like the the drive to want to do different things, want to make things better, sort of put scalable systems and solutions in place, even though it seems like a mammoth task that who will change and then people will probably adopt, not adopt. There's a bunch of uh, unknowns, but being comfortable in this ambiguity and knowing that uh, we're going to put something in place that's probably not going to work or is going to work poorly initially and then is going to improve drastically because we're going to make it improve. Just having that mindset of wanting to build scalable solutions, robust systems, that make you redundant, that make your own job redundant. If someone's excited by that, that's a useful thing. Uh, That's a useful indicator that they'll be pretty good. Being okay with presenting dissident arguments. Like uh, many times uh, since I did my MBA in HR, uh, I heard this quite often, like HR people need to be people's people, you know? I'm a people's person and I love people and I'm not a people's person. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, am I doing the wrong thing? I don't think you need to be a yes-sayer. In fact, I think that's pretty damaging because you have a better intuition about operations because you're working there. So if you're very agreeable, then you're likely doing more harm than good. And like I I don't know whether I mentioned it somewhere, I do think that better solutions, especially to pertaining to operations of an organization, are easy to defend and it's easy to convince people and make them see the merit in it. So you should be willing to step into that uncomfortable situation rather than going like, let me avoid this confrontation. Let me just do what you want me to do and I'm going to fix it later. That fix it later is a problematic orientation to develop if you're defaulting to it fairly frequently. Yeah. So uh, that would be one thing. Yeah, excited about learning new things. Also excited about working in a team. Operations can probably never be a one-man show. Uh, So you should be a bit of a team player and uh, focused on reducing uh, communication overheads, A, within the team and B, throughout the organization. And lastly, I would say the ability to wear sort of slightly different hats. Uh, Your role, if you're a good operations person, is likely never going to be the same kind of stuff over and over again. Uh, So you'll get new challenges. You should be able to tailor your message to your audience, uh, 
you know, uh, come down to or rise to the level of your audience, uh, the kind of nuance they want and need and be able to talk to them about that. So stakeholder, efficient stakeholder management from the perspective of being able to be high level or zoomed in uh, or, you know, very detail oriented wherever you need to be. So knowing uh, what's the kind of hat to wear while communicating with a particular person. I think these are some of the sort of very broad generalist kind of things that are good. And I have a strong bias for working with data, relying on data for your instincts rather than sort of these vague feelings that you can't really explain properly. But I also know great ops people who don't work too much with data already have some very good instincts, maybe because of a lot of experience under their belt kind of thing. So yeah, that's that's sort of less important. Are there any skills that are important in other jobs that you think aren't so important in, in this one? Oh, that's an interesting question. What, what, what are the weaknesses that, that you can get away with, maybe? So because operations are such a team effort, like there are going to be four or five people who are responsible for the efficient functioning of like a, I would say, 50, 70 people organization. And so because you're working in a team, you can afford to be bad at some things as long as you have someone in your team who's good at them and you can tag team efficiently with them. Mm. So I think you can get away with having many or, you know, most of these things absolutely absent as long as you bring something quite indispensable to the table, to the team. Mm. So if you're really good with numbers and not really great with interpersonal communication, which which is a fairly common thing to be found in the world, that someone's really good at analyzing numbers, uh, culling out insights from data, but uh, ask them to have 15 conversations uh, and, you know, get the pulse of the situation, they're probably not going to do a good job. So you don't need someone to have both of those things. Uh, Your team can get away with as long as it has both of these capabilities, but in different people, and they know how to communicate well with each other. Yeah, I was going to say, it seems like in operations, in contrast, perhaps with being a writer, um, the work kind of drives you forward because there's other Mm -hmm. people involved. You're working in a group rather than just by yourself. So, it's not, it's not quite that you don't need motivation, don't need conscientiousness, but like you don't need to be someone who can like force themselves to work by themselves on, on a task that they kind of have just imposed on themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, because there are other elements along the path to keep you accountable or yeah. where you're, you know, handing off a semi-finished process or semi-finished sort of deliverable and then they're going to take it on from there or someone else is dependent on your task. So yeah, it's easier to rally uh, sort of motivation. You, it, It's not that hard. Uh, to do this it's also easy to track where is the motivation failing and like which mm. piece of the chain is uh, failing to deliver to the to the extent that they need to be delivering whether it's like a person whether it's a whole team uh, so i think yeah that internal drive i'm not sure about this to be honest because i don't know if if someone just doesn't want to get out of bed and do anything then sure it'll be easy to figure out that they're the one who are not you yeah. know who's not doing this but that person will still if they want to continue will have to find the motivation and the will somewhere to be able to do it i think like someone who's in a job that requires writing they need creativity and sort of need to make sure that they're able to write even if they're feeling that if in a very yeah. blah place similarly if you have to execute like if you have to do 15 20 things today and you're in that mood of really not wanting to do anything and just bum around on youtube listening to videos yeah. so you have to bring yourself out of that funk and actually do those things because there's deadlines that you have to meet and commitments yeah. that you have to keep Yes, having a team makes you more accountable because, you know, they'll uh, tell you that you're being a bit of a bum (laughs) if if you're not (laughs) pulling through or pulling your own weight. Yeah. I mean, I think uh, one thing is that a lot of people struggle to motivate themselves in an environment with low feedback on how much they've accomplished and how well they're doing it. Like the classic extreme case is uh, people writing a PhD where they only get feedback from their supervisor every couple of months. And in between that, they just got nothing to go on. Uh, And I guess operations, fortunately, is is, is not like that. You get intermediate feedback uh, kind of all the time. Yeah. So you can get, yeah, if you're someone who like found a PhD, difficult then this this might be a lot easier <laughs> or at least at least within that one dimension yeah, yeah yeah absolutely yeah are there any other benefits of operations roles compared to compared to other positions as, as you see it uh you know what are the attractive things about uh, operations yeah. roles uh, that we yeah. haven't discussed already yeah i think we've sort of briefly touched upon all aspects of it one that i might want to double click on is that operations makes for very interesting opportunities in this community where you are working with organizations like fhi miri Chai Open Philanthropy Project and a lot of these places where really exciting thinking is happening and while this the, the things that we're trying to work on are in a very dynamic stage right now 
the fields and the landscape is evolving. As an operations person, you have the privilege to interact with all these people, absorb this knowledge, which I'm not saying researchers don't have, but by nature, their work at times is a bit more siloed where ha- they have to focus on their problem and tune out everything else. Mm-hmm. Operations people can uh, absorb all this information while developing skills that are fairly fungible. Like mm-hmm. those skills are going to come in handy, whether you're working with one organization or mm-hmm. the other organization. So you can you can switch to different cause areas if you feel that you know uh, you feel uh, strongly about some other cause area today while having developed skills that are fairly uh, fung- fungible transferable useful for that organization which is not true of uh, a researcher who's zooming in on one particular topic mm-hmm. or something like that so ops gives you that luxury and i think uh, there's a lot to be said about how important that can be especially mm-hmm. while these fields mature grow change yeah, what do you think explains the fact that so many yeah operations hires have just gotten promoted obscenely fast in uh, yeah in, in EA organizations? So that their skills are rare, or just that, or just that perhaps like the skills that they bring are actually very useful for like more senior management positions. Yeah, I think very competent people are doing operations in these organizations. Very few of them are there, so the ones that are there are obviously quickly going to fill in the. Uh, leadership or sort of the uh, heading these functions sort of positions fairly quickly, I imagine. And also because these fields are growing and this uh, operations in EA and X-Risk orgs is something that is being formally talked about and formalized in fairly recently now. Uh, it hasn't been around for a while uh, in the shape and form that we now talk about it, you know, uh, very defined and developed and sort of mature operations functions. Uh, we're still working towards putting them in place. So while the field's young, I think people who come in early are going to see good growth, are going to, if they rise up to the challenge, are going to rise along the sort of uh, organization hierarchies fairly quickly, which is not to say that uh, this is going to totally stop. I think any industry sort of functions like this, then you're going to have new talent coming in who these people can train. I'm not sure what is the attrition rate for operations people in EA orgs like do they churn into senior positions still looking at operations do they churn out of operations I'm not sure it would be interesting to you know figure out uh, what's happening with most of the people most of the first responders to ops needs in these organizations it seems like one of the key bits of value that you add and that good ops staff add is automating things uh, as much as possible like how do you go about identifying opportunities to do that and I guess why do you think you know many people are not inclined to do that Yeah, I think the right mindset for an ops person that I understand is to automate yourself out of your job and to uh, take over a bigger, larger share of responsibility. So free up your time in order to focus on better things, uh, more interesting things. So from that perspective, automation becomes super key in how the operations of your organization runs. So what are the kind of tasks that one should look to automate? Anything where you've stopped thinking and started just doing, you're so familiar with what needs to happen that you do this, then you submit that form, then you do X, Y, Z, you reach out to that person, they give you this document, you put that in that pipeline, like a fairly complex process, which is digital in some parts and offline in some parts, like it could be a clutch of all sorts of things. But if you hit a point where you know what needs to happen without having to sort of think much about it, then you should aim to automate it. And I use automation very loosely in this regard, like you can you can figure out how to deal with the process in the least cumbersome manner in the sense that uh, write a script for some part of it, outsource some other part of it that you think you don't need to have core expertise in, in-house or you don't need to upskill yourself for, or um, make sure that you have the whole process in a very detailed way written down so that anyone can do it. And, you know, you're not, uh, you're not a critical piece of the puzzle in any way for that Uh, process. So these are the things that I think I mean when I say automate something. And it's very useful to do that so that you have then the bandwidth to focus on other possibly more important, crucial things. Why some people don't do it or can't do it? I think everyone can do it. It's just a question of, oh, I can quickly do this in 15, 20 minutes right now. But if I figure out how to write a script and how to make this clunky system, like put everything in a folder and how to make this work, then I might take like five hours, two hours, one and a half hours. It's that temptation of doing it uh, by hand one more time rather than spending the amount of time you need to spend uh, to make it so that 
it'll just be a two minute thing from then on and not a 15 minute thing. So I'm sure people are more tempted to automate things where they have to, if it would be like, oh, automation allows me to do it in 15 minutes, not automation, not automating it allows, uh, makes, you know, makes me spend six hours. There it's very clear that automated, but where it's 15 minutes versus 35 minutes, it's unclear and people are a bit resistant to uh, the initial investment of time that automation or something requires, initial exploration, investment of time problem solving yeah it's interesting do you have a process for deciding in those in those closer calls whenever i've felt that oh my god i'm doing this again Mm. i think that's the time and it may be a bit late like i'm sure i can figure it out a bit sooner in the process but every now and then it becomes clear that i could be doing this a little sooner and Mm. over the years i've developed the appreciation for saving time wherever you can because if something's going to take me 10 minutes then I'm likely to do it and if the same boring thing is going to take me 40 minutes I'm likely to procrastinate so just I've developed very intuitive models of working with this I'm I don't really have like a formal system that if if it's more than 30 minutes then I'm going to automate it and figure out how to automate it but every now and then I see myself faced with a process where I'm like this needs to happen automatically and I can't be spending more time on this and that's when I put in the effort yeah arguably a bit late (laughs) I wonder if I don't automate things enough I guess I don't know how to program basically is one thing that probably limits me in some in some parts of this that I can't tell the computer to automate stuff. Uh, it, it, like, is it, is yeah. it typically involving programming or is it more like... It, it might typically involve writing up some, yeah, some mm-hmm. script. So if you're working, like I used to work a bunch with Excel and there was a time when I uh, did not know Excel well at all. I still don't know it. Like I think Excel's a really, Microsoft Excel's a really powerful tool. So yeah, there's merit in sinking some time and learning some good things there. And it might involve some programming. If you're dealing with other things as well, like some bit of programming, some bit of writing some script that allows different parts of the work to sort of talk to each other without you having to intervene so much. Mm. That's the best way to automate. That's the quickest and the most homegrown way of automating and not relying on someone else's expertise kind of thing. I have seen a lot of people who are not good with programming uh, sort of leverage the network around them very effectively. Very clearly tell someone that, can I block out an hour, two hours of your time and I need this done and this will save me this amount of time. Like you'll find many people who will be very willing to help you with them. And there's a certain, like, I think there's a large barrier to starting to try these things. And once you start trying them, there's Google can help you so much. Like, I don't know nothing, but I'm able to Google so much and get my automation fixed because it's so helpful. Yeah. I think part of my skepticism is that I often find that if you like, if you automate something, then you kind of have to fix the automation again after a couple of months. So things can seem easier to do like than than they actually end up. Like you get this kind of planning fallacy thing. Whereas I know, like I know how long it takes me to do the the, the dumb way that I've done it before. Yeah. Whereas like if I try to automate it, like I, was, I think it would take me half an hour and take me an hour. But I suppose with enough experience, you can you can actually estimate yeah. these things correctly. Yeah, I think some of it can be chalked down to experience. But you're right. There are times when I've like wasted a bunch of time in this sort of. Uh, efforts to uh, automate uh, things but I think again like it's it's that thing of keeping it well practiced this side of your thinking and then yeah. I personally it's would say that there's like net gain the net loss from uh, indulging this instinct to automate things yeah. uh, even at an individual task level for anyone like net gain from a time and uh, time spent doing things you don't really enjoy kind of perspective Let's talk now about what kind of career capital people get out of operations roles, I guess, both within the EA community and, and outside of it. Yeah. So if if someone's uh, absolutely bought in, and I think the 80,000 hours article touched upon this and talked about this quite quite systematically, if someone wants to stay within operations in EA and X-risk organizations, then obviously working in ops in these organizations and getting like hands-on experience is good for your career capital because mm. you're one of the few people who actually know the specific problems that you're going to have to deal with or these effective altruism organizations are sort of plagued with. But if you aspire to move out of the space uh, and go back to working for a corporate for-profit company kind of thing, then arguably your skills that you've developed here, the methodologies that you've honed and practiced while working in ops communities and in uh, EA organizations, 
is not the most useful, I would argue, because uh, we have a very different way of approaching uh, discussions and uh, focusing on how to calculate impact and Fermi estimates and all of these things that the world is not talking about. And that's not how they're approaching their operations. Like most of the companies that I know about that my friends are working in that I hear about are not approaching anything like that. How do they do it if not that way? They have more knowledge specific to their industry, specific to their operation. There's so much history of how ops have been done and evolved that there's a lot of data and insights available to rely on. There's a lot of what's already working for other organizations in the industry who are sort of doing very similar things available. There's data available on that in terms of best practices and benchmarks. So they have a lot to work with already. Uh, and I think that bit of a lot is sort of being generated for EA orgs now by uh, people who are attempting these things now and figuring out what are the commonalities between the various sort of ops roles and organizations. So from that aspect, I think career capital wise, if you want to go outside the ecosystem, it might not be really good. Uh, in order to to talk about being within the ecosystem, like be having worked in ops in EA orgs, how does it compare to having done uh, ops in a startup or having done ops in uh, a large multinational? Those are also things that you can sort of nuance and detail out. So I think if you've worked in operations in a large multinational or a consulting firm, it basically teaches you a lot of best practices for that industry, a knowledge about what are the things that have historically gone wrong? What are the interesting case studies uh, that you can learn that your organization or this industry can learn from? It gives you information about some uh, best practices, some good benchmarks, and equips you to deal with a very narrow slice of that whole value chain because you know, you're know you one part of a large, large system. You're one cog in the wheel, so to say, with a large MNC. Uh, working with a startup gives you a more diverse, uh, very fluid, flexible experience where if you're a driven person, sky's the limit of what you can try and uh, do and achieve and, you know, try and get involved in. So that gives you, I think, more useful experience that'll be more transferable to the EA community, uh, as I understand it. Yeah, again, would depend on the specific kinds of things you've handled. There's reasonable specialization that can kick in in small startups as well, depending on what they're focusing on. Mm -hmm. And that those, so, so we don't need great uh, I don't know, uh, digital marketing expertise in the community, according to me, there's no need for that because that's just not the kind of thing that anyone is doing. Mm. So yeah, that would be probably a sort of less ideal than some of the other roles where you're dealing with like um, complex projects, multiple stakeholders, uh, changing requirements, very dynamic environments. That's the kind of training that'll come in more in handy. So yeah, talking about it like from both perspectives, um, your career capital while you're working in EA orgs is solid. If you want to continue in the space, if you want to move out, it's questionable. You, you you still might be a great fit in some of the organizations. So I think people working with FHI or with or with some something with a Chai handling operations at Chai because they're focused on AI technical AI safety only. People who've done operations at Chai would probably make good fits for AI startups who are looking for some ops people because mm. the same kind of community you have to be interacting with, you have to have a certain understanding of the mindset of the safety community, which being exposed to the inside by working at something like a Chai can give you. Uh, I think that'll be a useful skill from the corporate perspective. So there will be avenues to follow those career trajectories if you want to move out. But yeah, it'll be very case specific. Yeah. Do you think people should consider starting their ops careers in, in the private sector in these like quite intense companies uh, like you did? Mm, again, I, it's, I'm not very confident of what should be done there. But I think if you've only gained, ex gained exposure of uh, how an EA org works and EA orgs are, are relatively younger if you compare to sort of the industry outside. So while you're sort of solving problems that are more relevant to the to the kind of problems you're probably going to be solving if you switch to another EA org, I think diversity of experience and even uh, the size and scope of things that you can get to handle in the corporate world or the startup world is very different mm -hmm. and probably useful, probably useful to have definitely, if not everyone, um, definitely not everyone, but definitely some people with uh, that different perspective, if they can come into the mix and add the insights, the knowledge or whatever they've gained from their outside ops experience to the EA community, I think that'll merit uh, the community in general. Yeah. 
I, I mean, that's that's a piece of advice that we used to give a lot is to go, go into the private sector first and yeah. then come into nonprofits. I guess we've become a little bit uh, more concerned that uh, that could be a mistake. Hmm. Uh, one one reason is just that uh, the knowledge doesn't always transfer over, as as you've said, because they're quite different environments. Another is just that uh, kind of we need people now, and de- delaying you know having impact hmm. for a couple of years to go and hmm. kind of continue um, gaining hmm. skills just could be could be a mistake because there's kind of an urgent need. Yeah, could be a mistake, but I find it hard to sort of qualify it just till that point because I think I don't know. Let's say if we have someone with ten years of experience, can they uh, can they bring in that additional intelligence or additional uh, uh, maturity in their thinking where they're able to better preempt problems that were bound to run into while scaling up and things like that? Because there are some things you learn only with experience. So I think. In all my experience of managing projects, different types of projects with different organizations, like switching streams, etc., is that the ability to manage a project well improves with managing more projects. So it's a very simple, it's, it's a very simple, basic, intuitive sort of thing to say. But I think it, there's something to be said about if you expose yourself to complex operations roles in the industry, you probably develop better insights and instincts, especially for being able to preempt problems, especially for being able to be extremely responsive in very dynamic and times of flux and uh, be be very mature in the way you lead the organization. So those are things that I think it's hard to say whether if we need people now and they come in now and we grow them and they don't have like a very deep awareness about what are the, what are the right things to be doing versus if we don't get sort of seasoned people right now, but we have effective altruists who are training in other organizations and might come in three, four years later. The kind of experience and expertise they might bring, how is that, whether it's more useful, less useful to get that talent right now or to get that talent after it's been trained in the industry? It's very unclear to me what's better. But yeah, it, hopefully the right way is to hedge and sort of have both uh, try and attract people who have experience, but also people who already want have the awareness that I want to be doing impactful work, mm. uh, have them have the avenue to bring them in the ecosystem and train them well. And I think as long as we're aware that there are th- these two things that we should be aware of, we should be able to manage. So let's say that for whatever reason, people are in a position to take a really high impact operations role uh, right now. Kind of when can they start training to, to get really elite at these skills? Um, and I'm thinking like, what could someone do when they're 15 or, or when they're 20 or, or when they're 25 if they think that this is you know, a route right, right, right that they might want to go down later? Yeah, if you have that awareness, then uh, doing some things and figuring out how good you are at it or uh, where do you need to improve is useful. So I think if you're 15, yeah, fairly young, I was a very ignorant person when I was 15, but I can talk to like today's 15-year-olds if they want to sort of test out what to do and how to hone these skills. It's good if you're the central planning manager officer for your family and friends, like if you're the one planning trips, if you're the one trying to plan activities in your school, uh, uh, taking initiative and uh, schools have fairs, they have sort of uh, big science projects and things that they hold. Uh, So trying to be a part of the team that's managing that whole affair uh, is like sort of like ops experience that you can get on board when you're 15. That's in a school or a formal setting. You can also sort of just uh, be the one-stop shop for like vacation planning and things like that for your family. Or if, you, if your family's throwing like a big Christmas dinner, then be be the person who's responsible for purchases of raw materials, be the person who's responsible for de- decor or something like that. So I think uh, those are good opportunities to uh, dive into things that you haven't done before, figure out where do you land, uh, what are the things that you're pretty ba- bad at or pretty good at. Mm. Uh, similarly, in a grad school, when you're 20, volunteer for the student societies, be instrumental in setting up or pushing the agenda of the society that speaks to you, uh, volunteer your time for organizations, companies, NGOs, basically wherever you can. Uh, in my MBA, we used to call these things called live projects where you just volunteer your time with organizations and they give you not very interesting or glamorous pieces of work, not even very important pieces of work because you're stepping in for two months and doing something for them, whatever they want to outsource and is outsourceable. But it's a good way to get an insight into how other things work and what do you, would you be excited to do the role of the person who you're doing this project with? So it's good learning and good, it's a good process of self-discovery of what you might want to do. So that's something that you can do at 20. And then at 25, I think, 
uh, if you want to work in operations, then you should be working in operations. Like you should be, of course, there are many times when you can't, like I've been in that situation where you know you want to and then there's no right role. You're stuck in a different geography. There are so many, like life plays its role and you're unable to make that switch to the, to the kind of thing that you want to be working on. So I think there you have to be a bit more entrepreneurial. It's it's a bit scary. It's not very, like I was not very confident of whether I'd be able to find a job that I actually liked and it, it's largely a feeling that brings you down uh, i think ea the fact that there's a community and you can reach out to is very useful it comes in very handy then so you should be reaching out to organizations who keep on saying that we need more ops people we need more ops people volunteer your time whether it's for a summer whether it's like whatever you can do to get some feedback on your work as well as some hands-on experience that'll tell you make you more aware of what you want to be doing so yeah, that would be my recommendation. Yeah. Does it matter very much what you study? I mean, you did quite a quite a serious degree in engineering and I guess also an MBA. Mm. Like, uh, uh, do, mm. do you think either of those things are really important? No, <laughs> I don't <laughs> right. think so. Yeah, yeah. Could, could other degrees be important? Possibly not. It's about, no, yeah, like I don't, like I'm sure uh, if you're doing supply chain in Amazon, then supply chain management MBA from a good place that trains you well is handy. Mm. But in my experience, my computer science engineering or my HR MBA are not what are the crucial elements that I would need in this. Uh, the kind of knowledge you have to acquire can be acquired on the job. Invariably, you do end up doing that. Every organization has its own secret sauce, mm-hmm. its own sort of models they work with. It's lingo, it's jargon. So you have to anyway, skill up a little bit, basically uh, get comfortable with that methodology. And I don't think there are any crucial pieces that I brought to the table because I had an MBA. In the EA community, you have like engineers. I think Marlo is an engineer. Mm-hmm. Uh, Michelle's a PhD in philosophy and she's done operations. So you have all sorts of people and doing it really, really well, whatever they're doing. Uh, so it's less to do with the background, more to do with uh, mindset and skills and the kind of skills you want to develop and are excited about developing. Yeah, I mean, does that suggest that people could potentially get these jobs without even doing a degree? Could they potentially slot into one of them at 19 and save several years? Yeah, I think and it's as true of this as is of research, uh, where you look at MIRI, you have people, you know, and they're encouraging. And FHI would, I think, also want to move in that direction where we're, for the training program, for example, we want to make sure that there's no absolute bare minimum requirement. Like if you have a talented person who has the awareness that this is what they want to do, then like a formal degree should hopefully not be a barrier towards that. It usually is in the world, but hopefully shouldn't be. And definitely, I don't think it's absolutely required to have any degree as long as you have some experience. And for for entry level roles where no experience is required, that's also not required. So it's just probably willingness and having some of these straight skills, mindsets that you can discern that probably this person will be good for operations. Yeah. Uh, There's one particularly talented uh, operations person in in the community who I know was already doing incredibly well at ops at 16 and 17 uh, before they even finished high school. Yeah. So it does seem like it's something that people can, yeah, Yeah. um, if they they have a real knack for it, then then they can do this work potentially quite early on. Yeah. I guess I'm always nervous about people uh, not doing a degree because that Mm. can potentially reduce their flexibility later in life. Uh, Yes, yeah. Um, Your growth options, your later in life options, uh, you you definitely close some doors if you don't have any degree because some people aren't willing to be Mm. uh, risky or they they see you at somewhat more unconventional than they can handle. Uh, So yeah, those doors get closed. So yeah, from that, that, like I don't have, I can't comment on, like, I, I really don't want to be encouraging people of not doing degrees and directly jumping into operations. I think you learn more about yourself as you spend time learning. Mm. So we've talked a lot about the pros of operations oh. uh, because we're trying to encourage more people to go into it. But uh, we should also give some time to uh, what, are, what are the downsides? Yeah. Yeah. What do you what do you see as the kind of the biggest arguments uh, against working in it? And, and what are, who are the kind of people who should stay away? Uh, I think if you're if you're uncomfortable with ambiguity, uh, if you get too tense about situations or too tense in situations where uh, you're facing something that's broken, you're facing you're having to put out fires. A lot of lot of the things are dependent on you, and you could potentially be the reason they fail. <laughs> so if if that kind of pressure stresses you out enormously, th- there are definitely some sorts of operations role that you're not very tailor made for. There might still be sort of more niche, more defined, a uh, more specific. Uh, less prone to uh, urgent requests kind of roles that you can take up. Uh, But I think largely 
the downside of working in, in operations is the kind of stress that putting out fires and dealing with ad hoc requests and or dealing with things not going right bring with it. In an organization like FHI or any other research outfit, I would argue that any problem that the org is facing, you, you can bet your money that it's because of an op- ops failure or something in the operation side of things not happening well. So being able to deal well with the pressure that you're likely going to put yourself in because, you know, we're all effective altruists who can calculate the impact that we're not having. (laughs) So, yeah, being able to rationalize or being able to deal with that sort of time pressure, quality pressure uh, that you're likely to be faced with. I think that's a hard part of working in operations in these organizations. Another thing I would say is that um, especially for people who are looking to, you know, keep honing their skills, ops in, in the community are handled by like people who were early responders and started doing ops early or people who have the time and the energy to devote to it. There aren't very many very seasoned people who are training, create ops stuff in the community. So your learning and development is largely in your own hands or in the hands of someone who's two years your senior in this whole se- on this whole scene and probably does not know too much or as much as they should know. So uh, there's that element of uncertainty about what you're learning and the skills you're gathering, how relevant are they going to be? Like, I'm sure if you're learning a new system, learning to program, like those are, sure, you should keep adding those feathers in your hat. But are you faced with challenging enough situations that you're actually, you're getting very meaningful experience under your belt so that you can lead like a thousand people organization? Or uh, if, if the time comes, can you sort of transition into a role that has that, that has a different size and scale? I don't think there are any opportunities in the EA community for handling those sorts of operations roles. So like I think that specifically for people who are coming in with experience under their belt, that's a bit of a dampener. Uh, so I could call it a sort of con of working in operations in this community. So uh, neither of us was born in the UK or in, or in England, but we've both uh, ended up living here for substantial periods of time. How do you find the, the British compared to, to Indians? Oh, yeah. yeah. I hope I offend no one with my responses to these questions. But It's very yeah, British. I think, <laughs> yeah, I think I've learned to be a bit more polished, unsure, keep, give, give the disclaimers all uh, right off the bat and talk about the weather. <laughs> That's what I associate with sort of the British style of communication. Mm. Uh, some, some level of awkwardness and some level of sort of uncertainty, giving disclaimers, being very polite, not making too much eye contact. Indians, on the other hand, I find it to be like very different. We're very loud. We come across very aggressively. We were very nosy. <laughs> we oh. talk to everyone we can find on the escalator or the subway <laughs> kind of thing. So I think, yeah, it's, it's a very different way of of communicating and interacting uh, culturally, I imagine, in my experience. But uh, there is one thing. I'm a huge fan of the British weather, which it seems like I'm the only one in <laughs> in UK. I, I have yet to meet another kindred soul <laughs> because yeah. I love the weather here. I hate the sun coming from India. Like we've had too much of it. It's disgusting. So I really enjoy the fact that there's so much rain and very little sun. It's, it's a treat to be in UK because of the weather that's there. Yeah, I think Australians kind of experience the same thing. Uh, like Australians and Brits have a lot in common, but perhaps uh, one thing is that we do tend to be a bit more loudmouthed and a bit more impolite and a, a bit to swear a little bit more and make, make it make it inappropriate jokes, that kind of thing uh, yeah. is, is very Australian. To be honest, I'm not, I'm not sure that I have adapted that much to Britain or whether I ever did because we had such a large number of Australians here anyway that we just kind of formed our own, <laughs> our own quirky uh, cultural group <laughs> that people just had to work around. But yeah. <laughs> Uh, how does the more aggressive Indian culture kind of play out in, in the workplace, uh, perhaps by, by comparison to, to FHI or, uh, you know, when you're working in London? So even even within the three organizations that I worked with in India, I saw, like, I experienced very different culture. So I might, I might not have any sort of thematic insights that I can attribute to India and the uh, UK, but I can definitely point to, like... While I was working in working at Snapdeal, it's a tech company, startup, the culture across the board is such that every month when we, when we were reporting on whether we'd hit, exceeded or missed our targets, if you if I'd missed my targets, I'd get shouted at. And I've I've been shouted at in front of 200 people, like in a very ruthless way. It's very common. I'm not I'm like this is not something specific to Snapdeal. Even people like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates have been known to be quite uh, shouty in their approach towards motivation and yeah. you know, telling people that they've, they've messed up. 
But I, I find it very hard. I find it very hard to imagine in the EA community people shouting at you for not having that. I haven't heard that. I haven't experienced that at FHI. Uh, I also think there's something to the British way of being a bit less hands-on or sit, not sitting on top of your head, giving feedback mm. mildly, gently. That I find it very hard to imagine people would be screaming themselves insane at each other uh, here. So that's a sort of different way of operating. That, but but I want to qualify it by saying that I have a very narrow slice of experience. I'm in no way generalizing any of this, but it's just in my personal yeah. experience that's the difference. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen someone shout in the workplace, but oh, uh, wow. but maybe I'm just not. Uh, yeah, maybe it's more of a private sector thing. Uh, yeah, I think you're you're you've worked in. <laughs> uh, I would say <laughs> more mature organizations, or uh, yeah, because the startup culture is pretty rough, pretty aggressive in US. Also, I from what I understand, friends who are working, mm. more mature organizations treat infringement like shouting and sort of giving into your baser instincts of, you know, uh, be, being uh, vocally sort of abusive or shout, bas- basically raising your voice against another employee. There's like repercussions in big companies for things like that. But in a yeah. startup, more informal setting, uh, people resort to all sorts of behaviors. Yeah. Uh, and uh, a lot is acceptable or not even accept. It's There's not like it's promoted or accepted, it, but it's tolerated because... It's just um, less yeah. professional and formalized. Yeah, environment. less professional, less formalized. So it's just a bunch of it's tolerated. And it gives you a thick skin. So I, I appreciate the fact that I've been <laughs> shouted at. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what I'd do. <laughs> All right, well, uh, just, just before we finish, uh, do you want to... There's presumably some people who are still listening to this uh, after mm-hmm. after a couple of hours and might be on the fence about whether they want to apply mm-hmm. for, for the roles that we talked about earlier. Uh, do you want to like, give them a final push to, to actually go, go to this article, read about it, and, and consider putting in their applications? Yeah, so I think my motivation to do this and my sort of expectation here is that I can reach out to some people who want to contribute, are looking for avenues to contribute, are confused about how to do it, probably are not going to pivot to research full time, don't want to do that, but want to be useful to the cause in general. Uh, So I'm I'm hoping to reach some of them because I was one of those people. And uh, when I was looking to sort of make an impact in this space, there was there weren't so many ready things to come by that I hadn't come across any sort of blog posts or podcasts that specifically attacked some of these things. So Hopefully, uh, we can reach some of those people who are a bit confused about what it might entail. Why might one do it? Is this exciting? It's hard, but it's really exciting. Uh, It's very, very rewarding. I think if you're bought into what the whole community is trying to do, and if you think that there's impact and change and success, uh, and when I say success in sort of achieving our end goals and objectives along this path, then it's a very good time to enter the field. Things are very young. There's a dearth of people who want to do this. So uh, coming in at this time and learning and growing and helping train other people, you could become like thought leaders, uh, so to say, within this within this community and be very instrumental in bringing about the kind of changes that our generation or the generation after probably will have like very unique opportunities to bring about the kind of, you know, the new paradigms that the, these technologies will bring. Uh, so working towards these causes, uh, even sort of farm animal welfare, alleviating poverty, those are very rewarding and satisfying things where we're likely going to dent the sky as effective altruists in the next 50, 60, 10, 20. I don't want to give it timelines. Like I'm, <laughs> it's a whole another discussion, years. And so you could be a part of that. And I think it's going to be an incredible journey. And anyone who's on the fence, I'd strongly encourage them to try. Reach out to people who are doing this. I'm very happy to respond to questions uh, on emails, etc. Specific questions, some doubts that you still have that are lingering, some things that you think are sort of too risky. So yeah, just be very open, explore this fully. And if you think you want to do it, take the leap, because I think it's a very good time to be doing it. Uh, and and, and uh, it's very important for good people to be doing it. My guest today has been Tanya Singh. Thanks for coming on the podcast, Tanya. Thank you for having me. Once again, check out CEA's Open Roles at centerforeffectivealtruism.org slash careers. We also list a wide variety of other roles, including operations roles, at 80,000hours.org slash job hyphen board. The 80,000 Hours podcast is produced by Kieran Harris. Thanks for joining. Talk to you next week.